Uh, I'm introducing briefly myself. My name is Andre Giuntini and uh, I'm Italian. Uh, we have two very extremely interesting case studies today in our short session. The first relating to the history of the mail in, uh, in China and the second referring to the equally important question uh, the African case of Zanzibar in practice, we will continue uh, the analysis of the crucial question posed in the title of the session that you have in the in the slide. What role, uh, ha as we have also heard in previous interventions, in previous speeches, uh, did the postal system and specifically the role of UPU play in the development the colonial relationship emphasizing geoeconomic and political aspects, exactly as our colleagues uh, did. I'm introducing uh, two uh, prominent scholars, uh, Lane Harris, um, Furman University in South Carolina, USA, and Camille Avrias, uh, Université and uh, Pantheon Sorbonne, uh, France. Please. Good afternoon. I, I hope I can keep you awake after that wonderful lunch. I would like to start by uh, thanking the Director General and the organizers of the Historians Colloquium. I greatly appreciate uh, being invited. <clears throat> so my uh, presentation... Uh, oops. My presentation today is about uh, China's entrance into international society and uh, one of the prominent ways in which China first entered international society in the early 20th century was by joining the UPU in 1914. So a little later than some of our earlier cases, but there'll be a lot of similarities uh, in the topics to the last panel, primarily because it deals with China's relationship with so-called foreign post offices or what Chinese calls alien post offices in that case. So as this particular uh, panel addresses, uh, the question of informal empires and it is certainly an important one in 19th century China. And so just a very brief context, uh, after the first opium war in 1839 to 42, China signed uh, what became later known in the early 20th century as the first of the unequal treaties. These were perceived by Chinese uh, to be infringements on its sovereignty. <clears throat> but as British, French, German, Italian, Japanese, and other countries, imperialist powers began building up the structures of informal empire in China, it looks similar to the cases that we saw, for example, under the Ottomans, the capitulations, unequal treaties in Japan, settlements and concessions, extraterritoriality, pedagogical regime of international law. And so China would respond to that later in the 19th century and into the early 20th century, primarily by perceiving that their entrance into international society required them to first and foremost present themselves as civilized. But of course, as we all know, no standard was ever forthcoming to the nature of that particular civilization. So today I'd like to talk about some of the actual circumstances some of the things that actually occurred as China entered that society and started to claim uh, its sovereign rights over postal affairs uh, in that particular case. So the Chinese post office, or was first known as the Imperial Post Office, was uh, authorized by the Guangxu Emperor in 1896, but there was a, a very brief period in which Sir Robert Hart uh, a British civil servant who was employed by the Qing government, so he's a Qing government employee, was authorized to establish first a, a small postal service uh, between custom, customs houses in the largest cities of China. And in 1878, the Universal Postal Union extended an invitation for Hart and his five post offices to join the union, but he demurred, saying that China could not accept those international obligations. When the Imperial Post Office was first founded in 1896, it was expressly as a semi-colonial institution. The highest level bureaucrats are all Europeans from a variety of different countries. Uh, but after Hart's retirement in 1908, all of the foreign staff who oversaw the Chinese Post Office at the highest levels would be French. 
So Theophile Pire and uh, Henri Picard Destelan are the two uh, most prominent figures here. But the vast majority, 98% of all postal staff are Chinese in this period. Uh, somewhat unusually in postal history, the Qing government decided not to grant a postal monopoly to Hart's Imperial Post Office. And to start, instead, Hart had to compete against six other existing postal services in China. The one we're particularly interested in today is the, the one at the bottom, the so-called foreign post offices. But if you have questions later about all these other ones, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, these uh, foreign post offices, or as the Chinese euphemistically refer to them as alien post offices, were, as we heard in the previous panel, also established in the Ottoman Empire, also in Japan after the signing of a series of unequal treaties. And I'll just put them all up here. These are the dates in which those various countries established post offices in China. Maybe the most uh, interesting case for uh, the last presentation about Japan <clears throat> is that Japan itself, even though it had European post offices in it, established a foreign post office in China in 1875. Uh, the vast majority of the time, these post offices followed the establishment of steamship routes between Europe and China, or in this case, uh, Japan and China. Also a point that was uh, previously made, all of the foreign post offices in China are not an independent administration, but they are part of the home administration postal services in Europe. So if you send a letter from Shanghai to London, you pay British postal rates, domestic postal rates. It's not international postal rates. So that'll become a, a major issue later on in China's uh, discussions. So here are just a few examples. This is how you can tell these postal services are all part of their home administrations. They don't have their own unique stamps. They simply overprint, depending on the country, the location in China in which that stamp was used. And then everyone, we all just like looking at stamps. And then these are uh, various foreign post offices in China. The one in the upper left-hand corner, you can, you can easily see it says U.S. mail on it, but that's a horse taking the uh, mail from the center of Shanghai down to the port to drop it off. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I think I don't need to go over the Universal Postal Union itself. Uh, the problems that it was trying to address in international postal relations uh, nor particularly its significant accomplishments. Those have been discussed and will be discussed uh, today and tomorrow. What I would like to say is just at the bottom here, this question about uh, who is a member of the Universal Postal Union is an interesting uh, question. And uh, from the very beginning of the union, it was decided not to uh, incorporate states, but instead to incorporate countries. And that was in 1876 and 1878 interpreted very broadly to, to include colonies, small groups of colonies. And in the case of the foreign post offices in China, they were added uh, to the union as belonging to the union in 1878. So all the British post offices in China have a separate kind of belonging to category under the Universal Postal Union, uh, starting from 78. But semi-colonies, colonies, all kinds of different uh, sovereign situations were allowed to enter the Universal Postal Union if they uh, requested. So when Robert Hart uh, founded the, Univer the um, Imperial Post Office in 1896, he immediately decided not to join the Universal Postal Union, recognizing that he could not possibly undertake the international obligations, requirement to deliver mail <laughs> sent to him anywhere in China. China, as you could all realize, is quite large. He couldn't possibly cover the entire country. And so instead, he just began preparations for the union by applying things like union rates to certain uh, international mails. Instead, his strategy was to try to compete with these foreign post offices and undermine their financial viability. Uh, he would try to uh, set up a series of uh, domestic postal reforms, domestic postal regulations that would limit how those foreign post offices could operate uh, within China. And then, most importantly, he, uh, and that's what the Fun little, he, he likes to write limericks. Uh, <laughs> the fun little limerick here is about, he decided to sign uh, exclusive mail carriage contracts with all of the modern transportation, uh, uh, excuse me, industries. So steamships in uh, 1896, 97, railroads in uh, 1903, to prohibit steamships or railroads within China from carrying the mails of these foreign post offices. They could still carry mails from ports to Europe, but they weren't supposed to carried them inside uh, China in that case. 
1901, uh, Hart sort of retired himself from everyday uh, operations over the, or everyday control, excuse me, over the uh, Postal Administration, and Theophile Pire became uh, what was called Postal Secretary uh, at the time. Uh, he became Postal Secretary just after the Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95, and after the scramble for concessions that took place, something like the scramble for Africa, but between 1895 and 1900, and then the Boxer uh, Uprising. And immediately after the Boxer Uprising, uh, all of the imperialist powers, feeling that the Qing Empire was about to collapse, began quickly expanding, particularly Japan, their uh, post offices inside China. This produced to Pire uh, concern about a rate war that uh, all these foreign post offices were charging domestic rates, and this was undermining the financial stability of the imperial post office uh, in this case. So he began, uh, we heard some discussion about bilateral postal treaties. Since China was not a member state, it could still sign uh, of the Union. It could still sign bilateral postal treaties and began to do so with the imperialist powers who maintained the foreign post office in China. So France, Germany, Japan. And in those treaties, it says that those foreign administrations are supposed to abide by UPU regulations. In other words, charge foreign rates for international mails. They, they don't end up doing that, but they're supposed to. Uh, instead, Pire also decided to rapidly expand his own postal network, trying to undermine um, the viability of those foreign post offices. So he opened up uh, 8,300 of so-called agencies. These are little postal agencies like mom and pop stores, little shops that could collect mail for the Imperial Post Office to compete with the foreign powers and also continue to prepare for joining the Union. So China did not enter the Universal Postal Union until quite late. Um, it had planned to enter and officially enters in September of 1914, uh, and it had planned to attend the first Congress uh, at that time, but it was delayed because of the outbreak of World War I. And so the first Chinese delegations are going to arrive uh, at the Madrid Congress in 1920. But before doing so, the Director General of Posts, Liu Fucheng, uh, decides to file a protest with the Universal Postal Union, believing that the Union can force the imperialist powers to abolish their post offices. He was wrong, of course, as, as we all know, but uh, presented for the first time China's case that this was an issue about sovereignty. So tried to raise the issue of sovereignty with the Universal Postal Union and was, uh, no surprise, we'll see in a moment, told that it was a political issue that could not be addressed by the Union. Nevertheless, because China declared war against Germany in 1917, uh, they were able to close the German post offices, the Austro-Hungarian post offices, and then the Bolsheviks and the Beijing government, <clears throat> excuse me, abolished their unequal treaties in 1920, and so their post offices uh, were closed at that time. So after uh, this preparation, China decided to try to make the case to abolish the foreign post offices at the Versailles Peace Conference, but uh, Clem Clemenceau uh, refused to address such, <clears throat> excuse me, small issues that didn't pertain to the post-war peace. And so the Chinese then had to prepare for the Madrid Congress. <clears throat> so Henri Picard d'Estelon, who was then co-director general of post, the kind of foreign uh, administrator of the post office, began a series of informal negotiations at Madrid trying to take the temperature of the remaining imperialist powers. He spoke with the British, the Americans, and the French, who all agreed verbally to withdraw their post offices when China was prepared to make its case, but was told that the Union Congress was not the place to make the case. <laughs> and so <clears throat> instead, he got them to agree to a series of informal stipulations that all the post offices, this sounds exactly the same, all the foreign post offices must close simultaneously, Henri Picard d'Estelon should keep his job overseeing the post office to maintain its efficiency. Siberian routes for British mail should be reopened. Censorship should be overseen. And then if the Chinese post office proves uh, inadequate that the uh, imperialist powers could reestablish their post offices. Uh, in general, <clears throat> the Chinese delegation was simply repeatedly told that this was a political issue that the uh, Universal Postal Union could not directly address. But important here, once China joined, that's where they first started speaking about questions of sovereignty over postal administration. <clears throat> so in 
So China made its uh, actual case at the Washington conference. Uh, most of us know that as a conference about naval limitations. There was a second portion of the Congress uh, conference, excuse me, that dealt exclusively with security issues in the Pacific and the Far East, as it was known at the time. That's the portion to which China presented its case on uh, the abolition of the foreign post offices. Before the conference began, uh, they issued another demand to the various imperialist powers to formally withdraw their post offices. The Chinese government finally granted the post office a, a monopoly so they could use that in their claims at the conference. And then when the conference actually took place, uh, China's head of the delegation made the case about uh, the abolition of the foreign post offices, saying that China, now China has a legal postal monopoly, has a very efficient uh, service, the probity of its employees is excellent. The foreign post offices not only deprive China of important postal revenues, but they also materially interfere with China's uh, sovereignty. So eventually, after a series of uh, subcommittee meetings at the conference, uh, all of the imperialist powers agreed to abolish their post offices by January of 1923, except Japan. And Japan requests a special postal conference in Beijing to deal with some technical issues between the two uh, countries. So that conference is held in the late fall of 1922. And at the conference, they deal primarily, the two sides deal primarily with technical, four technical agreements, kind of bilateral arrangement yep. uh, between China and Japan. And then the conflict, sorry, the conflict is over uh, Japanese post offices in what's known as the South Manchurian Railway Zone. This was a zone originally controlled by imperialist Russia, which then passed after the Treaty of Portsmouth in 1905 to Japan. So at the end of the negotiations, Japan would close about half of its post offices in China, but all of its post offices in the railway zone would continue to exist until Japan uh, invaded the Northeast in, in uh, 1931. So what we have here is the abolition of the post offices, China's first, uh, it perceives, diplomatic victory, regains an aspect or uses the rhetoric of sovereignty to regain control over its post offices and have it uh, internationally recognized. So the question is then, how does a country or a semi-colony like the Ottoman Empire, Japan, China. How do they enter uh, international society? Not by civilization, maybe by technical uh, intergovernmental organization, uh, but it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what we're talking about in that case. So eventually those unequal treaties uh, are abolished in 1943, uh, but I argue in the longer paper that this is a really requisite experience, this arguing about the post offices for Chinese diplomats and international lawyers as they prepared. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank, thanks a lot to Lane Harris. I think that uh, his intervention is was fitting perfectly with the word that we have in two brackets in our title, informal imperialism. I'll leave the word to Camilla Vias. Alors, nous, je tenais tout d'abord à remercier les organisateurs de ce colloque. Allow me to start by thanking the organizers of this colloquium, the Universal Union Committee, a serious uh, um, laboratory of the CNRS for the invitation to participate and to introduce our research. So we will address here the links between the UPU and the imperial and diplomatic rivalries of three great powers uh, based on uh, the post office between um, the United Kingdom, Germany and France around a city in Zanzibar. So, uh, between uh, 1875 and 1870, 1856 and 1870, there were three post offices, one that depended of the Indian post offices in 1875, that in 1895 became autonomous and only, um, uh, only was under the British authorities uh, until 79. A second opened by France and a third opened by Germany in 1890 in the city of Zanzibar, an eponymous city called uh, Munjuba on the western side uh, facing the coast uh, of continental Zambia with several 
tens of thousands of inhabitants um, or more, according to contemporary counts. It's a main port city of the whole uh, African West Coast. It's the main uh, commercial platform of the whole region until the 18th of the end of the um, 18th, uh, uh, 18th century and beginning of 19th, which explains this presence uh, on in the 20th century. There were treaties on trade and with the United States in 33, the United Kingdom, uh, then France in 44, and the um, Germany in 59. So it was a state uh, that was created by a division of um, Zanzibar and um, the Sultanate of Oman in the dynastic crisis called by the death of Sayyid Said Sultan, recognized by a French British treaty uh, signed in 1862, treaty of, the Treaty of Paris. So, as of 1870, the British um, had a strong presence in Zanzibar. Um, they had a strong influence over the Sultan in that period. Um, but the Sultan called Bargan Ibn Said. They had a policy to try to connect the um, island with through pack bows and a post office in 75, and then a telegraphic line in the Aden Le Cap axis. Um, the British were surprised by the initiatives of uh, the um, German explorers Carl Peters Clemens and Gustav Den Hart when they established two German protectorates on the territories along the Zanzibar's, uh, uh, Zanzibar's border. And they had one um, on the hinterland of the Emir coast facing the island of Zanzibar and the Sultanate of Witu, not far from the port city of Lamu. Um, so the British responded by establishing a protectorate in Mombasa, Mombasa um, and um, they obtained the protectorate over the Sultanate itself following the Heligo Zanzibar Treaty signed in 1890 between Germany and the United Kingdom. As for the French, their influence was not. Uh, so they were. A British territory. They ended up a British territory that was limited to two lie, uh, islands that you see in the rectangle on the screen. Um, and G Germany was left with two protectorates, uh, a German colony on the left in grey and the British in red above. And then the French influence was um, um, reduced but not absent, the consulate as well as the trading house um, were established on the line to Zanzibar and uh, on the axis Masai Pour Louis. So this French influence was strongest in two close regions to the Sultanate of the Comoros and Madagascar. When three post offices were inaugurated, the Sultanate and the um, capitals were already at the heart of these European um, conflict, so we need to see the post offices in the wider context of the expansion of post offices throughout the world. And the use, the the wider use of postcards, uh, then the post um, offices became a real uh, central rivalries between the French, the British, the Germans, and in Zanzibar, following the um, uh, colonial interest in the area, and. These rivalries was were in the interest of the users, since behind the rivalry between states there was a financial rivalry that makes quality of service something very important, um, especially on the Zanzibar and French side. So this was a the why that period of sharing uh, where, when these countries shared Africa was a challenge for the postal union, a challenge that was settled between the nations concerned with, uh, but in which the postal union was a tool of pressure between the states, um, British, French, uh, and private interests as well. <clears throat> so when the Berne Treaty was signed on the 1st of July, as, 
a, a 75. They weren't post offices yet in Zanzibar, so it was not until a British uh, post office that was opened in 78 that the postal agency became a post office that uh, was uh, the uh, under the remit of a Bombay post office that served the in commercial interests of the British present in Zanzibar. Um, and it assured a postal service for consular agents and uh, the two Pagbo uh, post companies that uh, had a liaison between Adel and the uh, Cape. So the, they also uh, contributed to putting an end to the um, slavery practices. And on the 1st of October 76, one post office was withdrawn, another was set up the, on a date we don't know between 76 and the Postal Congress of Paris two years later. So, Article 6 of the uh, arrangement that stipulates that Zanzibar, the Zanzibar office should be part of it, is no longer um, there. So, own the uh, post offices of Aden, um, Madura, per Persian, were under the remit of that uh, British post. So, it was only later that a first post office of Zanzibar became part of the UPU, the French one, and it was that was the first time at which the tariffs applied. So it's the first time that a West East African office was part of the union because uh, the Germans already in eighty eight had uh, offices that they incorporated in eighty nine. So the British. Uh, also joined in with theirs in 90, and then the Reichspost a few years later opened an office in Zanzibar, whereas they had, were already under British protectorate. There are two reasons for this. Uh, they didn't want to go through the French or the British for postal communications, and because Zanzibar was also the seat of um, the uh, German um, office, to a post that uh, wasn't yet, however, established on the continent until later. <coughs> so, in blue, uh, you see the French office, the red one is the British one, and then there's the embassy's neighborhood in grey, and then the German one below. And here on the picture, on the left-hand side, you see the French office in Zanzibar at the back, at the British office at the top on the right, and the German office and its staff right below. So the German office was closed the 1st of July 1891. Um, they had already decided to close it in, 90, in 1890, as uh, emphasized by the uh, British consulate to his French um, counterpart. Um, they, he stated that he believed that uh, there were many, there was a great presence on the continent, but they wanted to settle on the coast in what was still a village at the time. So there was a, a bilateral framework uh, that um, applied mainly to uh, those post, office, post offices, and uh, the same applied to the French. The French agreed to close their post office as long as the British would compensate them, especially in Madagascar. After the end of the customs dispute that ended in 96. So there were three rounds of negotiations in 93, one in between 1893 and 1899, and finally it was the French-English Convention of 18, no, of 1904 that closed the office, the French office, um, in that year. During the negotiations, what was important was the profitability of the, um, of the French office. Um, it was very expensive for the French in the negotiations with the British, and that's where the negotiations through the UPU were very useful. It was in this war and service um, dispute, so 
the UPU had much to offer Zanzibar. The decisions were taken by the Ministry in charge of Post Office and Foreign Affairs in France, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France didn't base itself on the British model, so they always um, postponed the decisions uh, for the French. So. Um, the first decision was in 1893 on um, packages, and therefore the year after the British had to review their system because they were it was higher, the prices were higher than tariffs were higher than the French system. The, the French feared that the British might interfere in their um, in their uh, trade because they uh, had to control over the customs. So in, the negotiations didn't lead to an agreement until March 1900, and the French managed for the customs checks to be carried out outside the office, so and there would be no interference in the, their affairs. There was also a tariff war going on. The union was supposed to uh, settle the matters, but um, they still had um, a managed to set up a smaller union, the British Postal Union. Uh, so a reform was initiated by John Ashelton, uh, who was also a journalist. In, in 1894, he had already um, recommended a special tariff for internal communications within the empire in order to promote British interests and their positions. 20 million letters and um, postcards were already circulating within the Union in the British Empire at that time. Alors qu'il était de 15 cents vers un État étranger, le tarif français vers la France était à ce moment-là de 15 centimes, et le tarif français vers un État étranger de 25 centimes, donc vers l'Inde, le Royaume-Uni et l'Allemagne, les trois principales clientèles du bureau de poste, puisque la colonie française sur place se comptait euh, sous les doigts d'une main. French colonies. So to conclude, the postal offices were part of the rivalries between uh, the English, the Germans, and the French. And in Madagascar, in Kenya, there was a German post office, and there was a full control of the communications. The British suspected that the French were covering subversive uh, information from Zanzibar, but once the British protectorate that was set up in uh, 1890, they decided that uh, they had to have bilateral negotiations. The Postal Union played a role there, not in a multilateral role, but as uh, using uh, rates and tariff uh, tools to be able to help with this uh, postal globalization. The conclusions aren't definitive because we haven't been able to use all the sources. Uh, in particular, there are German and some British uh, sources that we haven't been able to consult yet. Thank you. Thanks to Camille, uh, who focused clearly a critical note uh, in terms of European rivalry in, in Africa. So we are opening uh, to the floor for a couple of quick questions, possibly each one our colleagues. Microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm really interested in both your presentation because this is my main domain of research now. I wonder for the parallelism, no? It's really the same. The aggressive growth of a number of post offices, the rate wars, very, very strong rate wars, I'm thinking about the competition between the different countries in the same place, and it's strange 
But it's always the same story with the Ottoman Empire. The mandatory to study this, uh, this matter of foreign post offices in the colonies or semi colonies or uh, anyway, these uh, uh, territories uh, from a, a global point of view, no? Uh, because uh, because the answers, uh, the matters are always, uh, the questions are always uh, the same. So maybe it's not a question, it's a consideration. Maybe it's important to study this matter from a global point of view, not only uh, regarding the Ottoman Empire or China or Japan or Morocco uh, and so on, but uh, all the ideas of uh, European powers. No? I don't remember in your slide uh, uh, the number of uh, Austrian post offices and French post offices in China. Was more because uh, Germany has a, a low number of post offices in Ottoman Empire and large number in China. For France and uh, Austria is uh, opposite a large number in Ottoman Empire and uh, a low number in China. But if it says imperial uh, dimensions, no, of course. Uh, <laughs> So we have uh, we have to study about it. <laughs> Hello, is it working? Can you hear it? The microphone. Okay. Um, exactly. I I don't have um, a lot of response because you've made excellent points that I uh, agree with. Um, in the midst of working on the paper. I think it's obvious we need a lot of a lot more historical work on the Universal Postal Union itself. And uh, Camille made a wonderful statement that the Universal Postal Union was a tool of pressure as these different countries, imperialist powers, what, what have you, uh, competed with each other uh, on a global stage. And uh, earlier this morning, we heard uh, much about uh, the origins of postal services and capitalism. And that, that's certainly something we need to pay a lot more attention to. Uh, the Chinese are, in the history of postal services, quite late in developing one. Obviously, they're modeling it on European postal services. I, I showed a, a long list of other kinds of, quote-unquote, postal services that existed in China, none of which are similar at all to Western postal systems. Uh, but when China wanted to engage with the rest of the world on an international basis, facilitate trade, so on and so forth, they were obligated by the existing networks uh, established by the European powers to create that kind of postal system. Having heard the previous presentation, we can see the repetition of the subject of the European powers in the area and the context of Zanzibar. There's too little time between the creation of the postal services, the postal union, and in the European archives I've been able to consult, we can find some answers to this imperialism. Before 1875, there isn't really a source available on the uh, Western posts or other posts. It was really confidential or trusted uh, couriers that did the work. Yes, I really have the impression that it's session two that uh, shows us through this juxtaposition of cases what there is in common between cases. And there's a true definition. So I wonder if Lane or Bruno or one of our colleagues from Turkey or from Japan have any indicators of exchanges between those countries that were dominated to put forward their point of view within the UPU? Was there any coordination, what we'd call situations in countries that were in comparable situations or they did were they sort of kept in their silo 
I know some relation between Ottoman Empire and Perse. Je connais quelques connexions avec la Perse. No. I know some, I have some knowledge on Persia, but the Ottoman Empire and Persia were always enemies. But there were some links. But it was very interesting question to hear, but I'm not aware of any other cases. Uh, excellent question. Thank you, Diana. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that all of these semi-colonies, colonies, colonies uh, raised this question at the Universal Postal Union. And so they're returning the question back to Europe. If this is your game, we're playing the game, but now you change the rules? And of course, they change the rules all the time. Um, so whether this is a mask for power politics or constantly shifting the standard that's being required of non-Western places, uh, it's certainly something that most Chinese historians would accept. Um, but to look at your question from a longer perspective, uh, I would say that uh, China today stands as one of the pillars of Westphalian state sovereignty in the world still uh, fully embraces that particular notion. Uh, and China and Japan's role in the world economy and their uh, presentation of issues at a variety of international organizations uh, suggests that they've not only learned the game well, but are besting <laughs> many other countries today. Uh, not in the period I'm talking about, but from that longer perspective, they've certainly learned their way. In Zanzibar, there wasn't really enough time to talk about uh, the building up throughout the 19th century and the communication with other states uh, on postal services are not really known to us. Uh, um, I thank you so much. Uh, merci à tout le monde. Nous sommes en horaire. Thank you, everyone. We're right on time, and I'm now going to give the floor to my colleague Muriel Leroux. I think we can start our session. So I'm very happy to see that uh, quite a few participants uh, are staying here to look at the crucial question which defines, characterizes and uh, obsesses all historians, that's the matter of archives, because uh, compared to other sociology related subjects, uh, we need sources. And so those who say sources mean written sources whilst oral Recollections can be useful and can be one of the methods uh, used by historians. What we're going to be talking about this afternoon is postal archives and in particular archives uh, either that are managed by a foundation, which can seem strange when we're looking at the history of posts, which are normally national and state structures. And so they have a an historic archive heritage, which could be national, but we're also going to look at the archives of the Universal Postal Union through a biography of the directors. Now, before we start so that we can agree on what we're going to be covering, I'd like to mention one thing. So I'm a historian and uh, I can be quite touchy about the definition for historians. An archive is not a printed document. The reports that are maintained here in this August organization and which this, organize, this organization always loved are printed materials, but what historians like our correspondence, the things that are at the back of the file, the thing that we don't necessarily see in the official documents, but which uh, indicate the life of the organization. 
So these communications are going to give us uh, some information on what can be used to write the history of these international organizations. And I hope that the discussion that will follow the presentations we will hear from our panelists this afternoon. I'd like to thank them all once more for being here with us. But this will give us some more clarity on the reproduction of uh, a number of stereotypes or cliches that we see in publications uh, and which can often be the result of a lack of previous uh, consideration uh, by the authors of what they're holding in front of them. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce Anna Bacelli, who is uh, a member of the Foundation uh, Archives Portal Europe. And also we've got Mr. Luke Davis. So you have some 15 minutes to present. Um, hello, yes. So um, I'm, I'm going to do half the presentation and then I'll pass over to my colleague. Um, so Archives Portal Europe um, is... And seem to be working. Um, how, yeah, less. Um, Archive Portal Europe is a online aggregator of a range of collections from within Europe, um, but also from outside Europe relating to European history. Um, so it comes from 36 countries. Um, it's got more than 24 languages, um, five alphabets. It's a real sort of range of um, geographical breadth, um, but also a range of different types of institutions, um, uh, including national archives, um, smaller um, university archives, um, some uh, private collections. So there's a real sort of um, geographical spread, but also a range of perspectives. Um, which is really um, useful for particularly this kind of thing um, with its you know, universality at its core. Um, so it's really useful for um, research um, and as part of this we want it to be um, a tool that's really sort of collaborative and um, by researchers for researchers. So there are tools where you can um, make a suggestion, you can um, add external sources such as journal articles or um, relevant literature. Um, you can suggest translations um, and you can also contact an institution um, and you can let them know um, um, what you think about their collection or ask any questions. Um, and you can also assign it to topics, um, which will become apparent why that's useful later. Um, so this is what the search tool looks like. Um, so this is how you might search for the Universal Postal Union. Um, so here we can make use of things like wildcards operators and Boolean operators. Um, so the asterisk after the um, L in postal means that that can be followed by anything, which um, makes it very useful for um, different languages, um, uh, adjectival agreement. Um, and then there's also um, the question mark in universal, which means it can include either universal or the French universel. And then as well as that, you can put an or, and then it will also include um, other languages. You could also include other alphabets in there as well. Um, you can also um, limit your results to only digital items. Um, and that's the um, range of results you might expect to get from a range of countries and um, the sorts of um, uh, results that might be on offer. Um, there are some problems with the search, problems um, more um, obstacles to get around. So um, one of the things about um, Archive Portal Europe is it doesn't search within items because most items haven't been digitized, they haven't been um, ma um, machine readable yet, um, which means that you can sometimes get things that um, have keywords mentioned in their description, but they're not particularly relevant to the 
um, uh, resource itself. So here, for example, if you search in Universal Postal Union, you will get this collection from the UK National Archives, which is vaguely related to the UPU at certain points, but that's not a main focus of the collection. So to get around this, um, you do have to kind of approach um, searching in a quite a different way to how you might search on Google um, and use um, other um, keywords. So for example, um, communications colonial. Um, that is much more likely to get you, um, as we've heard in other sessions today, it's more likely to get you um, content that is more relevant to what the UPU um, uh, has in its history. And indeed, if you search for that, you do get um, some collections, particularly from the um, British Colonial Office, um, about um, the Universal Postal Union, um, about the stamps from the 75th anniversary, um, and also from um, some congresses in the past. Um, another example of um, what you might find, and this is probably the, the, the very best that um, the portal can do is it can give you the digitized copy. The second best is things like this, where it hasn't been digitized yet, um, freely available, but there are catalogs. And if you um, search for this, you'll get this. Um, this is the uh, Piri collection, again, uh, very relevant from a, a previous um, session. Um, and that is um, that will come up on on our search, um, and you can view um, the catalogue from Queen's Belfast um, with some translations and um, summaries of of the items. Um, and as well as this, there are also um, plenty of visual resources. Um, we put um, visual content side by side alongside um, written history. Um, because so much of the UPU's history is visual, it's pictures and videos. So we put that right alongside the written stuff. And on that, I'm going to hand over. Thank you very much. So, uh, okay, then uh, the second part of this presentation will focus mainly on how uh, Archives Portal Europe can be of uh, a great use for researchers working on aspects related to stabs at Flatley. Um, as my colleague has uh, said, uh, um, the portal has uh, some limitations, but if you apply, it, it also has uh, some advantages. The great advantage is that enables researchers to access results uh, from home at, to save uh, time and uh, money in, in regards to organizing their um, uh, research. So in, uh, we will briefly present um, th uh, three examples uh, related to philately at stabs. The first one uh, is about the national stab exhibition in Lucerne that, that took place here in Switzerland. Um, this is a very interesting case study as uh, um, stab exhibitions um, um, usually serve as a great opportunity for uh, cultural exchange uh, events. And in these exhibitions, countries have the, um, uh, the opportunity to showcase their history, art and achievements through the design and the themes uh, um, the uh, topics they have selected for their uh, postal uh, postage uh, staffs. Also, this uh, exhibition is very much important as um, uh, it took place uh, shortly after the Second World War, so it was of historical significance. And um, um, it was organized in the spirit of uh, reconciliation and uh, cooperation. The second example, the second case study that was uh, found through the portal is, a, is a, a good example of how staffs can be used for uh, doing advocacy for uh, policy. Um, this collection is from the International Institute for, uh, the social, for Social History from the Netherlands. Um, it is about uh, raising concerns for human rights violations in the Soviet Union and the impact of uh, the regime in uh, uh, opponents, in political opponents. It, it, was, uh, it was also about um, 
um, triggering the public discussion about against the political repression in the Soviet Union, despite the fact we know from uh, the from history that uh, these types of activities, these types of um, initiatives, didn't have a major impact in uh, the country. Uh, it is a nice example to see how uh, staffs can be used uh, for uh, raising awareness and for uh, doing advocacy. The third and final example is uh, linked uh, to, to, to Universal Postal Union, today's philatelic exhibition that you can see outside this uh, venue. Um, this is uh, from the UK Glasgow School of Art Archives and Collections. Um, the, these tabs were designed by Paul Hockert, a painter, printmaker, illustrator and uh, educator. He was born in 1917 and he studied art in, uh, at the Magister School of, uh, of Art. Um, his work is held by many uh, galleries, both in the UK and uh, abroad. And uh, these tabs were printed by uh, Harrison and Sons Limited, which uh, was a major uh, worldwide uh, engraver and printer of post stabs at banknotes. Uh, this company produced most of the um, British tabs at the at a sixty year period from uh, the nineteen thirties till uh, the nineteen nineties. Included the first uh, UK stab using the photogravure method in nineteen thirty four. Um, all in all, uh, Archives Portal Europe. Uh, uh, facilitate uh, our uh, can be a great and uh, invaluable tool to facilitate our research in the archives but also the portal has some limitations we will be happy to discuss uh, this with uh, you at the q a session thank you very much for your attention Merci beaucoup de nous avoir présenté euh, un portail qui permet. Euh... Thank you very much for having shown us this portal that shows how amateurs and historian amateurs can access archives differently. So now we're going to hand the floor to Bob Rinalda, who is a specialist in, uh, in the history of international organizations and. In particular, he has been working on a very interesting uh, biographical database which uh, um, covers the, the main uh, leaders within those organizations. And what he's going to tell us is very important in terms of um, the preservation of the UPU's uh, archives. So the floor is yours. Yes, uh, congratulations to 150 years of UPU. However, none of the directors has an entry in IOBIO. IOBIO is the biographical dictionaries of Secretary General of international organization. It's an open access scientific uh, project and you'll find it on this uh, website of my uh, university in Amsterdam. Um, I hope that among you there are historians or other scientists who will contribute an entry to IOBIO. Um, oh, I better look there. Uh, our directors or whatever title they have, executive heads of IOs, are they prominent actors in IR? Some will argue realist major states matter and non-state actors are a bit less relevant. However, when you do research, you find out that IOs are not simply forums for governments and secretariats do more than just administrative work. As in any organization 
organizational leadership by the heads matters. Okay, that goes to fast. Um, the UPU historian George Cobbing in 1964 argued to have true knowledge of the UPU, one must know its international bureau. And I would add, we should also know its directors and directors general. Um, the emergence of secretariats of international organization is a history in itself. And the International Telegraph Union already mentioned, its constitution did not provide for a secretariat, but its director, Louis Curgeot, created a bureau. And this bureau allowed him uh, to make it into a permanent organ, which enabled him to lead the organization and over time to lead it more and more. This is Louis Curgeot, and his secretariat model was copied by other public international uh, unions. And uh, you can say that the history of IOs and their secretariats was a process of evolution, of trial and error, and also of copying. What about the UPU? The International Bureau gets some attention in the literature and scrutiny of that literature showed that there's more room of maneuver for the Bureau and for the directors than I expected in the original form. What do we know about them? In my paper, which I sent around in Annex 1, you find all the 17 DGs that have existed, and it shows how difficult it is to get even the smallest basic info. For example, what is the exact starting or ending date of a director? Uh, I also give an overview of the main sources of information on the directors. Um, it's what is easily available, but it's insufficient uh, information to write entries. And IO bio entries cover the entire life of the person and all the different uh, careers. You can find it uh, on the internet. Now, you can, what I did in the paper is characterize all the directors uh, since the very uh, beginning. And you can see the elements creating the office, expanding the office the relationship with the state of Switzerland and the Swiss Postal Office uh, functioning during world wars or dying in office. Quite a few of the directors died in office. I can't change it. Working next to the League of Nations, but not being a member, becoming a UN specialized agency, having a first non-Swiss director, and development aid, which is an important topic, and handling competitors like the ITU and the, inter the technical revolution. So it's not yet possible to make a group analysis, which I would like to do. If you have enough life and career descriptions, you can see uh, what kind of characteristics you find with the different uh, directors. So they may have a common professional background. It was referred to, uh, you need an internal leadership, uh, making the organization move, but also external leadership cap cap capacities in relations to member states, to other IGOs, to NGOs, and there are relevant networks. So hence, we have to start writing entries for IO Bio, and that's an invitation to the specialist historians uh, present. Uh, why do we need them? Um, when you go to the websites of IOs, in general, they don't mention very much information about the DGs. But most of all, they don't mention information what they did when they were in office. Uh, 
they do mention when there is a big award, when there is a Nobel Prize awarded, they will mention it, but they don't mention what the successes or failures of a director are. Hence, to write an uh, entry for IOBio, we need historians who know, who are familiar what is happening within the organizations. So I focus now on a few of them. The first uh, UPU director is the frontiers person uh, on the edge of unclaimed tem tem territory. He's the pioneer who builds up the administrative machinery and sets the first institutional processes into motion. Well, you all know this is Eugène Borel, the first uh, director, and uh, he was uh, appointed by the Swiss government. He was 17 years in office. Did his position develop similar to the one in the ITU or was it different? Uh, how did he develop the administrative machinery? How did he increase his room of maneuver as a director versus the states? The issue of colonies, vassals, semi-sovereigns as members uh, mentioned uh, before. Was it just the secretariat that had a room of maneuver to take decision in this uh, field? Um, how did he work with or against the Swiss uh, state? Eugène Refi, he was the third director. Um, he was the one who received the German proposal for the monument, but he ensured, he took the liberty to say it in that way, that the monument would be in Bern and that the Swiss government was the one who handled the whole procedure. This was not the German idea, but anyway, the monument uh, arrived. Uh, what else did he achieve in his 20 years in office? Uh, what kind of leadership style did he have? How did he lead during the First World War when sending mail was restricted? What was his position vis-a-vis -vis the League of Nations initiative? I just moved one. World War, Alois Murray, who was the director between 1945 and 1949. So this was the time that the UN was created. And in 1948, the Postal Union entered the UN system, but kept its international bureau under Swiss supervision, where Switzerland was not a member of the UN. It received the uh, observer status. So this was a specific uh, position. As far as I know, it was the UN Secretary General, Trick de Lee, who initiated this and prepared draft agreement for the UPU Congress in 1947. I'm interested in what was Murray's role during this entire uh, event. Well, and as you all know, it took a long history uh, of ending Swiss uh, supervision. Edward Weber, who was a director, a later director general between 1961 and 1967, he's a special character. Um, it was the first time that there was one abstention on the government's uh, proposal, but nonetheless, it succeeded. And uh, Weber had very strong ideas about freedom of transit. Uh, he proposed uh, a new organization of the secretariat. And uh, most of all, he was uh, busy with the issue of should the uh, Postal Union keep its distance from development aid at, as it was developing within the UN. And he did something uh, very special in my uh, eyes. Uh, when he was on a trip to a committee meeting in Tokyo in Japan, he also wanted to know some uh, first-hand information uh, by some of these countries. So he visited those countries and uh, requested first-hand information. And when he returned from uh, Tokyo, he visited seven Asian countries. He also visited African countries. 
and uh, nobody had told him to do so, but he simply did. And he had the information. There were some postal administrations and there was a UN representative in those countries. So he had very exact information and uh, result was uh, that his autonomous action, to put it like that, resulted in more cooperation with the United Nations Development uh, Aid. So I think this is very remarkable. Michel Rachi, the director between 67 and 1973, was the first non-Swiss director general. He was Egyptian. He had an internal career from assistant uh, director general to real director general. And uh, he strengthened uh, collaboration with the UN family. He made all kinds of stuff and other regulations. And he created the first technical assistant division. It is very difficult to find information about him. The most important piece of document that I could find is his portrait. I have no information about him, except, of course, his formal uh, positions. So, my invitation to the historian to write an entry of one of the uh, elder uh, directors, or director general for IOBIO. Uh, there are many ways to write a history of an I.O. You can base it on expertise, as it was mentioned, on its congresses and decisions. You can make an institutional analysis. You can have regionalism. There are all very good inroads. My focus is on the senior staff, the executive head, senior staff that uh, belongs to the directorship, the administrative machinery and leadership, both internal and external. Interesting enough, uh, if you study the leader of an I.O. and his or her policies, that provides very good in entry into understanding the organization and it provides some clues about their importance. Uh, and when we have a group of executive heads, it's also possible to have a group analysis. Uh, so you're welcome to contribute an entry to IOBIO. Uh, more details are in my paper and I have a few copies uh, with me for those who haven't received it. And uh, you can find everything on the IOBIO project on the website. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, chers collègues, d'avoir euh, tenu le temps. Thank you very much, colleagues, and also for sticking to the limited time. Uh, I was discussing matters with my colleague, Mrs. Koch, and we think that the major contribution of these international events is to um, contribute something. And I must confess that before with Sebastien Richet and Léonard Laborie, among others, that we co organize this international event, I didn't know anything or I didn't almost didn't know anything about Anand Luke's uh, presentation. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about where you found your sources and how we might have access to those documents and what drives your foundation. So what was the aim of the foundation? Perhaps you could tell us about the nature of the documents that um, we might find there. And with regards to Bob's communications, so the this the story of uh, leaders, director generals is something that I'm very interested in. So I have a couple of questions, but also I wanted to take stock about the uh, use of these biographies. Um, it's not just about putting online the stories of people's lives or their professional backgrounds, but it's also um, in order to give us food for thought and to perhaps um, 
take some perspective on what we think. So this self-analysis is to perhaps review prior conclusions or uh, um, interpretations of uh, the archives. And what Bob communicated is that through this network of UP leaders and through the story of the staff of the UP's International Bureau, uh, we should gain information about the relations between states and international organizations, because on the one hand, there are international speeches, but there are always shadows behind the scene, and we don't know much about these. We only know about what states and international organizations are authorized to unveil. So. Perhaps this prosocography, uh, the work that is online is a very minute, but it will give citizens um, an overview of how this um, anthill was built. Because very often we see organizations from the perspective of the organization, so the history of the UPU by the UPO or the history of the French Post by the French Post for um, post-French masters, um, postmasters and historians. But this morning we talked about the fact that these organizations involve national, bilateral, domestic, international and also cross-border relations. And so what I was trying to get at is that what our colleagues have been telling us today by showing us and making new sources available and showing us new um, bodies of work, we are able to think about with a, a new perspective, think about these organizations and by taking a look from above, what is the UPU? How did it become a technical agency of the United Nations? Because it's not a neutral state of affairs. All the organizations that preceded the United Nations didn't become technical agencies under the United Nations. So why at some point in time did one feel necessary to um, sanctuize these communities well, we all have some ideas about the reasons why uh, certain data are fundamental elements of state's development, but thanks to the sources that we were given this afternoon, perhaps we can analyze these uh, international organizations differently, have a different uh, perspective on them, and perhaps put each of the protagonists in the right role. Because what is striking from what we've heard is that behind the different acronyms, the official names, there is an, a huge amount of individual acts that explain how the uh, UPU has lasted so long so far. And so I'd like to hand the floor back to the the people in the room to try to get answers to uh, the way we could uh, get new sources and access new archives. Sebastian? Sebastian Richesse from the Committee for the History of Post. So thanks. Allow me to thank Bob Reynalda for his intervention. I don't think I would be betraying my thoughts or Leonard's uh, thoughts by saying that when we thought about the organization of this event, we uh, were aiming at having new research dynamics with, through a community of historians that would either directly interested in the history of domestic pose or in cross-border diplomatic um, uh, relations, the usefulness of posts and postal organizations uh, therein. So your uh, intervention was uh, like a call for help for general mobilization among historians interested in the posts. And then to my left, I see um, the 
outlines of this chronology that shows the different director generals of the the post this postal organization that was swiss uh, up until two decades after the second world war and then i look around i see a couple of um swiss uh, historians chairing you talked about uh, logistical issues because not all live next to the UP's archives but perhaps we could uh, call for um, the um, um, for the appropriate researchers um, to get involved I think France perhaps could publish uh, an bio, uh, biographical notice of uh, the post uh, and then the one that uh, shows the f ways in which the French post um, mutated and evolved. I think there is quite a lot that could be done by doing so. It would be a new um, momentum and would enable us, as you were saying, to work on the human dynamics, on the human commitment uh, and look into the, the, the contribution of these uh, leaders of the post in these international relations. So I think this um, notice would be quite easy to uh, draft as uh, high-ranking civil servants in the uh, organizations of posts with contacts and uh, businesses. It would be possible to find the biography to uh, make progress on obtaining information. So thank you for that awareness raising and for that call for us to um, to, to mobilize. Yes, Richard and Hola. Yes, um, it is quite striking that the leadership has come from Switzerland for so long, and that Switzerland has successfully maintained a low profile in international geopolitics, and the two may not be unrelated. The, the success of the UPU owes at least something to its ability to maintain a low profile internationally. And I think it would surprise historians of international relations to recognize how tightly controlled it was within Switzerland. Uh, Gabriel Balbi has written about the international strategy of the Swiss government to rebrand itself in the second half of the 19th century. And this rebranding may have something to do with the low profile of the men, I suppose they are all men, who actually ran the organization. So I, more research is worthwhile, of course, but it's interesting that so little is known. Perola, si tu veux poser ta question. So if you'd like to put your question also. Okay, thank you. I would like to just take a, a question to Bob Reynalda. Reynalda. Uh, I would like you to talk more, a little bit more, about uh, uh, the general uh, director, Edvaldo, Edvaldo Cardoso Boto de Oliveira, Boto de Barros, which is general director between 1985 to 95, 94. I think he was a Brazilian director. And it's very interesting because he was director during the democratic opening in Brazil. Brazil faced a military regime uh, just before his entrance in the UPU. And in this time, in, in 1985, Brazil was opening in a democratic way. And I've already spoke with a retired secretary of him that by, by instance lives in my small town. 
he nowadays he is retired and he told me that this uh, this director Boto de Oliveira has a close relationship with militaries so who put him there so the connections between uh, the relations i think this case exemplifies the relations between the dgs and their countries and this is a topic that i think it's important and your research is about thank you Avec un micro. So, if you could take the microphone, please. Avec un micro, Bob. Microphone, please, Bob. Can I ask a question to my neighbors? Um, how is it, how can I find out about all the fine work you are doing? Are you making some propaganda in certain official circles, etc. because I'm really moved by all the kind of things you do, but it's very, because I know it's very helpful. Um, yeah, so um, it's, I mean, partly through um, uh, things like this, partly through things like grants, and um, one of the things we do is uh, dissertation grants where, um, one of the conditions is also that the um, digitized catalogs go on to the website. So that's a way of both sort of raising awareness and also sort of building up um, the materials. Um, but really, I mean, the aim is to get sort of, you know, European history and heritage as, as open and available as possible. Um, and um, one of the best ways really is just to um, uh, share it. One of the things you can do is you can you can register for free, and you can you can create a bibliography on the website, and you can then share that with other people. Um, and it really does sort of rely on sort of partly on word of mouth of it being a collaborative um, um, effort through doing things like topic tagging and things like that. Um, so that's kind of yeah, that's. Um, um, that's kind of it, really. It's um, you have anything to add? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's basically um, um, we just want you know, as as much of Europe's history and on on the on the portal as we can, um, because that's that's how it becomes you know as valuable a resource as it can be is is when you have all the um, perspectives, both geographically and in terms of range of places. Um, and it's going to, I mean, yeah, it's for content providers, it's completely free to, to ingest your catalog and, um, data into the website. Um, and it's also very easy for the user to use it because you're not having to load all the documents themselves. It's only the descriptions that you're loading. So it's, um, um, the aim is to make it as accessible as possible and make it completely free and have it be something that, that anyone can use with more or less any level of technology um that's kind of like the the ambition really um but yeah word of mouth is is is, is the, the the best way of um um of sharing the resources on there um, and have and have a go at playing around with the with the search tool Merci beaucoup pour ces, ces précisions. Uh, Thank you very much for that uh, further information. I have another question for you. You don't keep the doc documents. You uh, create inventories and uh, digitalize them, but the documents remain in the places that uh, hold them and manage them. Um, yeah, so we, so the website itself doesn't actually hold the documents, um, which is um, um, it's a good thing in a way because it means that so much more can be held. Um, it means that it's, it can run much faster. So what it does is it stores the archival descriptions um, of what's available. Some of those things are then digitized and you can then view them through the um, institution's own website. So things like the um 
videos and pictures that we showed towards the end, um, those are viewable on on the website because they're um, hosted through the um, the institution's own website. Um, but yeah, anything that um, is digitized can be viewed by through us, but it has to it relies on it being digitized by the institution. But that's another sort of um, key aim through things like the digitization grants is getting things, getting as much digitized as we can get. Um, because one of the useful things about it is that it teaches you about all the things that are available to view. Um, it, it shows you the range of materials that are out there. Um, and even if you can't see the document itself, it um, informs you about things that you didn't know existed in places that you didn't know existed, particularly when so much history has moved around over the centuries and, you know, over the years. Um, but obviously it's much better when the thing is actually digitized and you can, you can view that. But yeah, we don't host anything ourselves. It's, it's always through the institution. If I may. Um, okay, if I may. Uh, you can also apply uh, um, filter in your search in the portal at the access digital objects when uh, they are uh, available. Um, it's not the same for uh, all entries. It depends of if they, um, uh, if they are digital objects, if the archival institution has digitalized its uh, collections, if they have granted access to these digitalized items to the portal or only to just descriptions. It depends. Um, uh, but uh, um, as Luke uh, already said, that we also stated that during our presentation, um, it as a historian and researcher, how I see it, I see it like um, Archives Portal Europe can serve as a compass for our research. It, it can uh, be the starting point of our of, of our research to see what what uh, items are available in in archival institutions related to our research. It better it helps us to better organize the next steps. Which collections we should uh, um, uh, see? Which institutions institution should we contact with? It, uh, also, the portal provides us um, a contact form for its institution, so it, it's just a tool that facilitates our re uh, research and sometimes it helps us to avoid unnecessary traveling. At, uh, um, uh, it saves, it helps us to save time, time and general to save re uh, resources. Merci. Oui, alors, il y a deux questions, monsieur. Thank you. We have two questions. Uh, two gentlemen here and uh, Mr. Forceville, I was going to ask you a question. Sir, if you could go ahead first, please introduce yourself. Thank you. I am Isaac Mambayo from the post in Côte d'Ivoire and I chair the uh, Council of Administration. It's really a pilgrimage for us when we look at the postal sector, and I'd like to thank the IB for having taken this initiative. I have quite a lot of things going around in my mind, and I'm going to try and share the ones that are most uh, interesting, but I'd like to thank everyone for their very good contributions. And note that Mr. Renalda called for contributions to add to the portal he works on. And I listened that one of, and heard that one of the director generals from 1964-67 traveled to Africa, mainly in relation to work with the United Nations correspondent to uh, collect information about uh, the uh, joining of uh, countries in Africa to the uh, Universal Postal Union. I haven't been here very long, but uh, 
at the beginning, about 10 years ago of my career in the postal sector, I had that, uh, I, I met a gentleman who was almost a hundred uh, years old in, in my country, who said that it was uh, the postal service was very important for the colonizers, but also for the administrations in our country. And that uh, they'd been set up by the colonizers and that the African continent is a very large continent and one where oral history is very important. So we have oral history far more than written history. So I wonder if it's relevant that we could think about setting up a a link with African historians or a hub for African historians in order to share the experiences of the colonial postal administration, which was the first steps in terms of our African postal services when they started to modernize in joining the UPU. But before that, we had a strong postal traditional because our traditional chiefs and village uh, chiefs uh, corresponded. And there wasn't an infrastructure, there weren't roads, but they covered uh, many kilometers of foot to uh, distribute uh, correspondence to those who were administering the region. So I'd like to know how we could create a bridge so that uh, information can be shared from Africa on the postal sector, which grew more sophisticated through its uh, addition to the UPU, but uh, which has a rich history that we've been hearing from you and that we could add to, and I'm certain that uh, Mr. Reynalda could give me more information, but I saw that on your portal you have uh, information about uh, colonial buildings that uh, held the posts and uh, treasury buildings, but which were elements of colonization, but there were other types of postal relations that existed that may not have been picked up because they're not described, they're not in documents. And so that's a large part of history that may have been forgotten. So I think we're going to continue discussing all these uh, matters uh, beyond our session. I'm going to take up the other two questions. I have a biography of uh, Franco-African historians who started to work with the uh, committee with our history, history committee and have been looking at some of the points you've uh, raised, but we're going to give the floor now to this gentleman, if you'd like to pose your question. Africa, um, South Africa to be particular, uh, Rhodes University. Um, I'm going to be brief and to the point um, and address my question um, to those who set up the um, portal or the platform in the European archive. Are there any plans of foot to approach the UPU archives to get their material included? I spent an afternoon in the archives here yesterday and I was struck by the fact that there's no inventories, there's um, no catalogs, it's hit and miss approach. Um, yeah, I mean, um, um, it does it does sort of rely on there being a catalogue in the first place, which is kind of the sort of, it's kind of the sort of chicken and egg situation is you know, we would love to have, you know, the UPU's archives on the system so they become more available and also so people don't have to travel to, to burn to know what's, what's there. Um, but I think it's, um, but yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's relies on there being a catalog in the first place. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of the, the, the difficult answer is, I think that um, in order to put the catalog on, it has to exist. Um, but certainly if that catalog did exist, then yeah. Um, but also, I mean, like, yeah, the, 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 um, 
we can always like work with with people to to put together a, the, the digital uh, the data and then ingest that into the portal but it does yeah rely on there being some level of catalog to start with i think um do you have anything Hello. Oh, yeah. oh. um um, if I may, okay. Uh, as Bob uh, said, he had, he had, it was an open invitation to contribute to his project. Also, Archives Portal Europe has an open invitation to anyone who is interested to join. There are var various ways to, 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 to join the, the portal as a content provider. And this may refer to UPU Archives. Um, they can provide access to their collections in their um, um, in, 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 a way, in, the, the, in a way, they, they feel comfortable to do uh, so. It can be just a description of how uh, the collection is held. It can be access to digitalize, if any, material, etc. And also, there are other ways to be involved with, uh, to be, um, to collaborate with the portal uh, as, uh, for example, ambassador. Ambassadors usually um, um, are working on uh, disseminating the, uh, the, the the portal's mission, uh, its scope, uh, and uh, uh, as country managers, also there is also this role. This uh, usually refer, uh, is for people. Excuse me, est-ce que vous pouvez faire okay. bref? J'ai encore des questions. Il a I beg your pardon. We are running out of time. Um, also, uh, just one quick uh, sentence. I uh, thank you very much for the point for Africa. I think that. Um, uh, um, the process of decolonizing uh, history is uh, ongoing. It's very much important. And, uh, thank you for this comment. Merci, excusez -moi, mais je voudrais donner thank la you, and I beg your pardon. I wanted to give the floor to Mr. Jean-Paul Forceville and Christian to hear their questions. So, Jean-Paul is an eminent uh, high-level uh, member who should have his uh, biography included. Uh, well, that's really too much. Uh, Jean-Paul Forceville, I'm in charge of uh, European and international groups of La Poste Group, and I am part of the um, chair of the POC. I'd like to thank the chair of the Administrative Council and uh, are representatives of the three major pillars here who are here. Now, it's often said that, uh, I mean, I don't know if the UPU is a very, is a happy, a lucky organization, but uh, we've waited 150 years to have an event such as today's event. But first of all, we need to move forward with the time. And I had one question, but I also wanted to uh, make a comment to, to our colleague from Brazil. We knew Mr. Voton Barros. We knew him at, we met him at his last uh, Congress at the, towards the end of his term of office. And we have good memories. Now, at uh, the POC, I ask for us to have a, debriefing on today's meeting because I think it will be of interest to everyone and when we hear about um, archives, this is a bit of a slide, we see that the international organization realized that it was a little behind with this archiving and codifying the archives. So this raising of awareness has been done, so that's important. But if I may, as uh, chair of the POC, could I ask something of our members? What could I ask them? What uh, is of interest in terms of archives? Uh, how should they proceed if they wish to assist in really building the historiography of the UPU and uh, more information on the system. Jean-Paul, I was going to uh, give the same response as I just gave to the other president. 
We will continue this exchange uh, off mic later, but in France, the French posts that were in a similar situation to the UPU in 1995 uh, looked at the issue and recruited uh, someone to uh, look after the conservation, someone who had the task of uh, going through the archives, uh, removing the kilometers and kilometers of archives and then making sure it was available to citizens and to postal workers. Uh, so none of this is lost. Uh, this 150th anniversary denotes the importance of carrying out an audit of, uh, in the same way that the French Post did in the 1990s. And last question. So mainly a question, Christian Son, I'm from uh, Denmark at the University of Roskilde. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. I have two comments. The first is that there are staff and former staff of the UPU who have an incredible knowledge of the history as well as of the documentation that exists. So we mustn't forget these people as sources of information. And I'm certain there are current uh, staff members, uh, Jose Hansen, for example, here beside me, who would be very happy to provide names and email addresses, telephone numbers. And unless I'm mistaken, there's even a uh, meeting, an association of UPU retirees which without any doubt would be very happy to help historians in finding what they're looking for. And that's my first comment. And the second, it's more for the UPU. I think it would be an excellent project for students to try and uh, collect and sort through all the documentation and maybe to uh, digitize some of the documents that takes place in many organizations and libraries and so forth. It's often given as a student project. So maybe history students, uh, why not? That's one way of uh, doing this in a slightly less expensive manner than taking on a whole team to carry out the work of making it digital. Thank you, Christian. I'd just like to give the floor back to Bob to reply very briefly because I'm told our time has run out and we'll have to continue our discussions over coffee. You are right. When you are revisiting uh, the history through its sources, you suddenly understand that decision making is sometimes very special. There are things that you didn't take into account before, but that do play a role. And that's one of the things we find out through this uh, indeed collective project. We do that on purpose because uh, several people can help us to get such an entry because they collaborate. Yes, uh, Switzerland had a low profile, but um, you could also say Switzerland had its own assumptions and that continued in that history. So, uh, that. Uh, Brazil, um, one of the things you find out when you do this kind of biographical research is that you find out about what's happening between the international level and the national level. And that's something we don't discuss that much, it's under research. But the interesting thing about Brazil is that its foreign ministry had a very explicit policy to engage in international organization and through that uh, enhances its position. So I don't know enough about your Brazilian uh, director general of the UPU, but I would not be surprised that there was 
all kind of support in order to make him function or to deal with certain problematics uh, that would be uh, to be expected in the Brazilian case, to put it uh, like that. And regarding Africa, um, doing our research at the moment, we uh, should discuss what is the function of an international organization like the United Nations? Is it uh, promoting independence? And is there an opportunity for certain African countries to engage in that opportunity? Or is it continuation of something that existed? I think that's a proper uh, question to ask. And in particular, um, we are discussing whether international organizations provide a platform, a forum for these countries, either by themselves or as a group, uh, to participate in something that's happening in the world that's also going on at the moment. So I don't know about the Cote d'Ivoire uh, case myself, but um, I would be interested to hear more about that. Thank, th thank you very much. Merci à nos, à nos, thank à you nos... to our panelists, and I'd like to thank uh, all of the audience as well. And I have taken note that we should write the history of the UPO, do prosopographies, uh, collect uh, information, look at oral archives. We need to catalog and digitize the UPU. Uh, documents. So we have a, a lot of work. So I think we'll meet up again for the 180th. Now we've got um, coffee wait, awaiting us. Now we are moving toward globalization. Well, focused on the States, by the way. So I will start in English and sorry, John. Uh, Richard, I will uh, I'll move to the, the French, if you don't mind. So we will have um, a new session, and because we are running out of time, uh, we will try to focus and, and keep the, the agenda and the schedule. So the, the next uh, session is focused on transnational national making of national postal services. We have three speakers. Uh, the first one, Richard, Richard John is here and the two of the one are supposed to be online. So uh, in order to keep uh, <clears throat> the, the time, I will just say very briefly one or two uh, words in French. Sorry, Roger. Uh, Richard, I'm sorry. Um, nous allons donc uh, parler de la naissance. And so we're going to talk um, about the birth in, in a way of the different cross-border models. Most of this sessions and the prior sessions presentations have emphasized that many of the events and uh, developments um, appeared at the 19th century at a time when nation states were slowly being built. And then uh, the creation of this cross-border model also raised the problem of the complex uh, situation with national sentiments um, uh, and the, how to coordinate this with tools, uh, management models, organizational models that uh, would be supranational in that context. So I will say no more. Richard John, you have the floor from Columbia University. You will introduce uh, us the way how the, the the way in which the Universal Postal Union shaped postal policy in the United States, 1874 and 1913. You have the floor. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all for uh, persevering. We're almost there. End of the first day. Okay. Right. What do I do? Will Trump 
pull the United States out of the Universal Postal Union. So ran a teaser for an article that appeared in the online version of the storied U.S. magazine Time in September 2019. My slide. The re this recent chapter in the long history of the relationship of the United States and the Universal Postal Union is not what I'm talking about today, perhaps thankfully. Yet the frustration of a U.S. president with the regulatory status quo had been occasioned by an issue that at various points in time has troubled the relationship between the United States government and the Universal Postal Union. Of course, the standard setting body that has coordinated the circulation of postal items across political boundaries in a quest to create, as our conference theme proclaims, a single postal territory. Trump's main concern, if the news coverage of this set to can be believed, was the supposed advantage that current UPU regulations have offered to Chinese manufacturers intent on reaching U.S. market. A distinct, yet in some ways oddly related issue, surrounded the long and often acrimonious 30-year public debate that had been waged in the United States in the period between 1883 and 1913 over the admission of parcels into the U.S. mail. That's what I'm talking about today, the UPU and parcels in the mail. This controversy originated in 1880 when the then recently established Universal Postal Union agreed to set up an international parcels post. The service went into effect in the United Kingdom three years later, 1883, and it was this event, that is, the advent of a parcels post in the United Kingdom, and not the prior UPU directive, that attracted the attention of reformers in the United States, including Connecticut-based parcels post enthusiast James L. Cowles, who editorialized in favor of a U.S. parcels post almost continuously the next 20 years. The International Postal Union, Cowles gushed in a book published in 1894 that called for the establishment of a general freight and passenger post, in effect, the nationalization of the railroad, such, a, such an international postal union was the greatest of all associations for the preservation of international peace and the advancement of international prosperity. Well, Cowles thought so, but a lot of Americans weren't paying attention. And incidentally, Cowles referred to the organization as the International Postal Union and not the Universal Postal Union, and that convention was common in the United States at the time. To continue with Cowles, the ideal conditions of things, Cowles went on, was the complete annihilation of time and space and the perfect transit within the limits of the planet and it is toward this goal that the world is hastening. Nationalization of the railroad, parcels in the mail were all part of this vision that Paul Cowles articulated. Well, ta President Trump would assuredly have found Cowles' optimism troubling, for it would have led to an enormous influx of parcels. Yet Trump was far from alone in his concern for the potential extension in the mandate of the U.S. Post Office Department to include the circulation of items weighing more than four pounds, which when Cowles wrote was the limit, four pounds. This would prove enormously contentious for 30 years. Now, little if any of the public debate over the mandate of the Post Office Department in this period would concern the UPU. The UPU was neither a target of public opprobrium, it wasn't in the press, nor with few exceptions was it even a bit player in the public mind, had a very, very low profile. Indeed, perhaps one of the most durable conclusions that one can venture about the UPU and the United States in this period is that few Americans knew of its existence and even fewer cared. And we can reach that generalization because we can now do lots of keyword searches and see what got into the press. Well, this obliviousness, that is to say the UPU in the United States, it was reciprocated when, for example, 
The Bern-based lithographer Rudolf Munger designed a color lithograph to celebrate the UPU. It's the lithograph of my slide. This is very similar to official materials that Munger prepared, but this was a commercial product. When he designed this color lithograph, he chose to depict what the UPU today calls its postal territory. Well, what was the postal territory? Well, it's five women, each of whom is dressed in the characteristic garb of a different continent, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, the Americas. And these five, this is a model for the, for the UPU monument. The five women surround a globe, right, upon which there's a document celebrating the establishment of the UPU in Bern, or the Postal Union, then called the German Postal Union, in 1874. Now, the woman symbolizing Europe holds a quill pen in one hand and the proclamation in the other leaving little doubt that the Postal Union is a gift from Europe to the world. The Americas are depicted as an indigenous supplicant, not entirely fully clothed, but garbed in traditional attire. There on, on it would be on the far left. So this is a very Eurocentric view of global communication. Now, patriotic-minded American journalists would occasionally point out that the first international postal conference had been proposed in the 1860s, we heard this this morning, by the U.S. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair, and that the ensuing event, Paris Postal Convention of 1863, had been coordinated by a U.S. diplomat, diplomat named John Casson. There he is there in the bottom right. But this was not by 1900 how the history of the UPU would come to be remembered either in the United States or in Europe. And it's interesting, Blair is held up. He's the postmaster, the expert, but it was Casson, the diplomat, who actually did the work. But all that will be swept aside by the Franco-Prussian War and by the quarrels between the French and the Germans that define the identity of the organization for the next 30 years. How did Americans in the fin de siècle then view the UPU? entirely through the lens of letter writing, not parcels, but letter writing. And this is not surprising since there was no parcels post in the United States. The United States, in fact, was the last of the major countries to establish a parcel post, not until 1913. From a U.S. perspective, instead of, here's the burden perspective, from a U.S. perspective, the postal territory, as it were, consisted not of five continents, as it had been for Munger, but of two worlds, as you see here on this image. This would be popularized, uh, this idea of two worlds would be popularized by the World's Columbian Exposition took place in Chicago in 1893. And to underscore the unity that letter mail communication had wrought, New York City postmaster and his staff commissioned holiday greeting for his UPU colleague. That's the picture I'm showing you here. So this is from the New York City postmaster to his colleagues, I hypothesize, probably colleagues who might be coming to Chicago for the Columbian Exposition. In this holiday greeting, the old world and the new world are quite literally tied up in a bow with letters flowing freely between them. Left unspecified is the mode of transportation. The only means of propulsion in this uh, image is a horse, which was a part of the official logo of the post office department. You can see it up there on the left. If you look closely, you can find the staff, or what I take to be the staff, of the ancient Roman messenger god Mercury. But that's it, allegorical, as was the UPU and as is the UPU monument. Well, how long can the delay how, how can the long delay, sorry, in the adoption by the U.S. Post Office Department of Parcels Post be explained? For Cowles, the culprit was the railroad. In his view, railroads charged outrageously high rates to convey the letter mail, and for this reason, they should be bought out by the national government operated as a public utility. That was a common view in the United States in the 1880s. This was Ed, the era of Edward Bellamy's looking backward when he envisioned the entire economy being nationalized. That was a Christian socialist view, nothing to do with the later socialist uh, arguments that would be controversial for different reasons. Others would point to parcel delivery firms as the antagonists, such as Wells Fargo, Adams & Co., and American Express. It was these parcel delivery firms 
that performed the task of transporting parcels weighing more than four pounds. And that was the postal limit until 1913. So you got railroads, you got express companies. Now, none of the largest and most powerful parcel delivery firms were corporations, yet critics in Congress and the press would sometimes depict them as monopolistic trusts, as a uh, cartoonist Udo Kepler would in 1910. And you have to take a look at this image. Did, to get the point, did the trust control of Congress block Parcel's Post? Kepler asks. So the express companies here are those cows fattening on one side of the fence, and it's the pusillanimity of Congress which is blocking this uh, positive innovation. They refuse to back Parcel's Post because they've been bought off by special interests. Parcel carrying profits accrue to the expresses, or the cartoonist Kepler, he's the son of the famous cartoonist Joseph Kepler, if you know that. Um, parcel carrying profits accrue to the expresses, while the government is forced to pass on to the people a mail carrying deficit that Parcel's Post would presumably eliminate. Okay, this is a popular image. This is not what actually happened. This is a popular image. For it was not only, or even e e really at all, the expresses that blocked the rapid adoption of Parcel's Post. This is a mistake to claim par that Parcel's Post is blocked by express. From the inception of the Post Office Department in 1775, lawmakers had confined the agency to the circulation of lightweight items that contained what law lawmakers called intelligence letters, newspapers, magazines. Anything weighing more than four pounds was banned from the mail. I was just at the Swiss National History Museum, magnificent uh, institution in Zurich. The Swiss Post was bound up with moving passengers and stagecoaches. Nothing like that was ever contemplated in the United States. Just information or intelligence, as they called it. And this intelligence-only policy had been instituted to facilitate the circulation of the time-specific broadcasts on commerce and public affairs, and that's where the U.S. Post Office Department excelled. When the United States joined the UPU, United States postal administrators limited circulation within the United States to letters, intelligence, information, but they found themselves obliged to convey parcels that originated outside of the United States in a different way. And to meet the letter of the law without expanding the mandate of the agency, they relied on the expresses. This compromise appealed not only to the expresses, but also to radical reformers such as Gardner Green Hubbard, who upheld the distinction between information, which in Hubbard's view justified the extension of the mandate of the post office department to include the electric telegraph, right? Telegraph transmitted information, therefore the government should run a telegraph. Distinction between that and goods, which for Hubbard should not be part of the post office department. So he could lobby for the expresses to block the extension of the mandate to parcels because parcels were not intelligence. Telegraph was intelligence. Well, historical writing on the slow adoption of the parcels post in the United States makes much of these expresses. But I, having studied the thousands of petitions to Congress on parcel post-related issues in this 30-year period, and I've gone through every one of them, that makes it clear that the primary obstacle to a parcel's post was neither the shippers, as the reformers Cowles and the cartoonist Kepler assumed, nor constitutional originists, as postal telegraph enthusiasts like Hubbard might contend, but instead the opposition came from merchants terrified by the dislocations that a parcel post would cause for country storekeepers and the distribution network that had sprung up to keep their storefronts well stocked. They wanted to be the middlemen between the farmer and manufacturers, they, and they recognized with a parcel post they'd lose that role. And once again, it's a cartoonist that makes this point well. Parcels Post, this is Ido Kepler again, he informs his readership in 1911, will hasten a revolution in commerce by directly uniting the producer, who is there on the right, and the consumer on the left, and cut out not only the express, but also the middleman. Okay, And that's a more accurate understanding of what's going on from having worked in the archives.
wholesalers, retail storekeepers, and their many allies in the press, an interest group that as a result of its spatial dispersion, its political influence at the grassroots, was far more influential than the expresses, these groups, wholesalers, retail storekeepers, and their allies, blocked the adoption of a parcels post for many, many years. It was this special interest that best explains why the United States would be the last major industrial nation to adopt a parcels post. During the presidential administration of Theodore Roosevelt, 1901-1909, the first major step toward a parcels post would occur with the establishment by lawmakers of a partial limited, it was called rural parcels post, Partial Limited Rural Parcels Post. The key event came in 1907 when a U.S. Postmaster General threw his reputation behind the establishment of such an institution. Now, this Postmaster General was not a Western populist, not a champion of the farmers who wanted a parcel post, which they were deprived of for many years, but instead it was a prim and proper Massachusetts conservative named George von Langerke Meyer. That sounds like a prim and proper Massachusetts conservative. George von Langerke Meyer. His biographers say, well, you know, Langerke is German, but on his mother's side, he had pure New England ancestry going back to the 17th century. It was Meyer and his successor, another New England-born Republican named Frank Hitchcock, who oversaw the implementation of the Parcels Post, and with the opening of a parcels post tunnel, as the cartoonist Kepler depicted the advent of parcels post in 1913, the U.S. government had finally conquered Mount Middleman, creating a single postal throughway linking producer and consumer. Well, what did the U.S., what did the UPU have to do with this reform? The answer's mixed. Without a doubt, the UPU had furnished a precedent that reformers like Cowles found it advantageous to cite. Even critics of Parcels Post would sometimes concede, as one hardware industry lobbyist would around 1909, that the UPU guidelines were the best rationale for the reform. The UPU had it right, we just don't want to do it. Yet what is perhaps most remarkable about the second phase of, parcel, of the debate over Parcels Post from 1907 to 1913 is the extent to which it had the support of Easterners who saw it as a convenient tool to expand the domestic market. Easterners supported it, and it was opposed by Westerners, including Midwesterners, fearful of its impact on small towns, that is to say, the impact of economic consolidation. Neither are much concerned with international competition, as was Trump recently. The issue is the domestic market. The resulting parcels post zone map made a last page, yeah, made allowances for distance. Yet after 1913, the die is cast. A new kind of society had been hastened into existence by the government, consumer society, in which it would become increasingly possible for anyone in the city and the countryside or in between, to get access to the latest consumer goods. The extent to which the prospect of a consumer society remained a threat can perhaps best be illustrated by taking a look at the 12 postage stamps the U.S. government issued in 1912-13. These are the parcel first parcel post issues. There's not a single consumer in that image. Yet it was this transformation, consumer society, that endure, that, that is the most enduring legacy of Parcels Post, just as it was the implica international implications of this transformation for the international balance of trade that so troubled President Trump. To conclude, did the UPU shape U.S. policy in the period between 1874 and 1913? With regard to parcel delivery, which is what I've talked about, the answer is a qualified yes. Lawmakers in the United States had good reason to limit postal expansion to embrace goods as well as information. They wanted information, not goods. That was what their constituents, the shippers and the wholesalers told them. Had there not been outside pressure, postal administrators might well have continued to rely on non-governmental parcel delivery firms well beyond the First World War no pressure from Congress. Yet it was the Atlantic Seaboard Republicans rather than the hinterland Democrats who, at least in the United States, were the leading agents of change, overcoming resistance that originated among merchants who feared with considerable justice the creation of a single postal territory would destroy their local monopoly on trade, 
a monopoly power no less onerous for the nation's farmers, if we think of them as consumers and not as producers, no less onerous for the farmers than the monopoly power that had been long exercised by the railroad and the express. Thank you. Next speaker, Stefan Koschenberg. I don't know if he's online. I am here. Okay. Welcome, Richard. So, um, um, Richard, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping to French. Um, Richard uh, Koschenberger uh, Kochersberg is going to uh, present a paper on transnational influence on the development of the United States uh, parcel post. Okay, we're going to share our screen. I wish I could be in Bern with you, but uh, thanks to this amazing technology, I'm able to join you from Washington. And let's see if we get the right screen up this time. Are we seeing the correct screen? I can't tell from here. Anyone? Perhaps yes. you may put it in full screen. Your screen looks correct. Yeah. Thanks very much. So the title of this uh, research is Transnational Influence on the Development of International Parcel Posts. But to put it more simply, a single parcel post for, hello? Could you put in full screen? If you click on the, down below the right hand side of the screen, of your screen, because now we've got the surroundings of the PowerPoint. Oh. Perhaps you could control it from your end? Okay, we will, thank you. Yeah, could you could you stop sharing, please? Yes. Thank you. Here we are. Thank you very much. Yes, and. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Richard for his uh, excellent presentation. We will have a bit of overlap, but my presentation will take us up to 1984. Um, we could subtext this, a single postal territory for parcels. Next slide, please. On November, in November 1887, Nicholas Bell, Superintendent of Foreign Mail for the United States Post Office Department, made a personal personal delivery to the White House. The package was addressed to President Cleveland's young bride, First Lady Frances Cleveland. Inside the package was a lady's fan made from native Jamaican woods, ferns, and flowers. It was made by the Women's Self-Help Society of Jamaica. The sender was the postmaster at Kingston, Jamaica, Frederick Sullivan. In a letter accompanying the fan, Sullivan wrote, it's not intended as a present, but as the first offering of what Jamaica has to give in return for the great boon of parcel post exchange between the United States and Jamaica. While we have no record of what Mrs. Cleveland thought of the fan, her package was the very first piece of parcel post delivered in the United States. Next slide, please. Over the next quarter century, thousands more parcels were mailed between the United States and scores of other nations. Yet during that time, not a single piece of parcel post could be sent from, U from one U.S. address to another. On January 1st, 1913, after 25 years of exchanging packages with distant lands, the United States citizens could finally send parcel post to each other. 97 years elapsed between the United States delivering its first parcel in 1887 
and when it joined the UPU parcel post agreement in 1984. In the interim, many factors went into shaping United States policy on parcel post. Many of those factors stemmed from internal ideologies and domestic politics. Less obvious is how transnational influences shape parcel post policy. Next slide, please. Starting with the 1863 Postal Conference in Paris, the United States was an early advocate for international postal reform. It lagged, however, in implementing some of those reforms. It was one of the world's last major nations to establish a domestic parcel post and among the last to join the UPU Parcel Post Agreement. Long after most of the world's nations signed the UPU Parcel Agreement, the United States maintained an array of bilateral and multilateral agreements. Next slide, please. The UPU concluded its first International Parcel Post Convention in 1880. At that time, the United States had no domestic parcel post and could not accept items weighing more than two kilograms. The barriers to domestic parcel post were geographic, technological, and political. The political impediments were rooted in the philosophy of laissez-faire and the belief that government should never compete with the private sector. The opponents of domestic parcel post were able to delay its establishment for three decades. At the same time, a variety of transnational forces influenced the development of the United States Parcel Post domestically and internationally. Next slide. When he became Postmaster General in 1889, John Wanamaker noted this curious anomaly in our postal system. He attributed the lack of domestic parcel post service to the political power of the railroads and express companies that controlled the delivery business. He wrote, nearly every country in Europe has established a parcels post and managed it successfully to the great satisfaction of the people. It can only be a question of time before it will be undertaken in some better form in this country. Next slide. Protectionism was a driving force in United States international parcel post policy. European powers were seen as economic rivals. Pan-Americanism meant that the United States favored parcel post agreements with Western Hemisphere countries and avoided agreements with European nations. Even when the United States eventually entered European agreements, they were more limited than the agreements with American nations. Following the successful introduction of domestic parcel post in 1913, the United States did not join the UP agree UPU agreement on parcels, but continued to negotiate bilateral agreements. Next slide. Following the UPU's 1920 Madrid Congress, representatives of Western Hemisphere countries focused on a restricted postal union of their own. In 1921, the United States, uh, next slide, the United States joined the Pan-American Postal Union, now known as the Postal Union of the Americas, Spain, and Portugal, and signed on to the parcel post agreement of that union. Next slide. World War II caused a dramatic shift in the United States parcel post. Due to new economic realities, political realignments, and technological advances. The economies of most European and Asian nations were in ruins after the war. Former competitors were suddenly partners in the mutual project of rebuilding. United States policy on international parcels adjusted accordingly. Next slide. After World War II, international parcel post played an important part in the European recovery plan, better known as the Marshall Plan. Over four years, starting in 1948, the United States provided $13 billion in aid to help prevent starvation, repair the devastation, and begin economic reconstruction. The Economic Cooperation Administration, or ECA, was created in April 1948 to oversee the Marshall Plan. Next slide. The famous CARE package was created at that time by nonprofit organizations, but ordinary Americans could send relief packages of their own. 
the ECA subsidized international parcel post rates to encourage private individuals to conduct their own foreign aid program. Postage rates on relief parcels were cut by four cents per pound. To be eligible for reduced postage, the parcels had to be clearly marked USA gift parcel and contained food, clothing, medical supplies, or household goods. In 1949, some 14 million gift parcels were dispatched to countries in Europe and Asia. By 1951, conditions had improved enough that the postage subsidies for gift packages were ended. Next slide. Wartime advances in shipping and aviation facilitated the post-war movement of goods. In 1948, the United States Congress authorized a new service called Air Parcel Post. Air parcels could reach their destinations in days rather than weeks. Demand for Air Parcel Post grew quickly with over 1 million pounds dispatched in 1954. Next slide. Containerization, bulk billing, and computerization streamlined the handling of parcels. New technologies increased demands for goods and faster delivery. In the 1960s and 70s, the UPU devised methods so that parcels could travel and clear customs more quickly. Next slide. The UPU worked to refine rates and regulations and tackled the thorny issues of land and sea rates, transit charges, and terminal dues. The lack of a consensus coupled with new technologies created openings for private sector competition. While at the same time, the reorganization of the postal administrations in many countries, including the United States Postal Service, required the post to now be self-funded. Next slide. Advances in aviation, telecommunications, and computer technology made it possible for private couriers and express companies to gain a foothold in the marketplace. These companies initially specialized in urgent documents and small parcels. As more private couriers entered the marketplace, they challenged the post's monopoly through litigation and legislation. In 1979, the United States Postal Service modified its regulations to permit private couriers to carry extremely urgent letters and international ocean carrier documents. Next slide. The world's postal administrations faced an increasingly competitive global parcel post network. At the 1984 Congress in Hamburg, these transnational forces came to a head, leading the United States to join the UPU Parcel Post Agreement. Next slide, the last slide. Accession to the parcel, Postal Parcels Agreement was not the end of debate. New technologies, globalization, and private competition continued to challenge the world's posts. During subsequent Congresses, the UPU Parcel Post Committee took up many contentious issues. The key difference was that those discussions took place within the UPU with the United States as a full participant. As far as parcels were concerned, the world was now a single postal territory. Thank you very much. Stefan, so we'll move to the last speaker. Hola. Notre dernière. Uh... Our last. Monica. Monica. Yes, I am here. Hola, que tal? Hola, <laughs> que tal? <laughs> Thank you for Spanish. Our last. Uh presentation will be given by Ms. Monica Farcas from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and it looks at postal universalization, transformation of the space and time imaginaries in the second half of the 19th century in Argentina. Thank you.
good afternoon. I thank the organizers of the colloquium and the participants for this very interesting space. This paper is written within the framework of wider research in connection with my doctoral thesis titled Argentinian Postage Stamps Issuance and the Debate Around the Building of the Nation, 1856-1915, where we intend to restore these postal devices to the conflictive social political network involved in the constitution process of the Argentinian national state. The proposed time frame allows to look at them in the light of debates associated to the place these documents hold in the nation projects at play. The postal system was visualized as an instrument capable of modeling the territorial and national imaginary from the post and telegraph agency. Strategies were developed in order to set criteria, regulation, publishing, and postal artifacts, which contemplated both iconic and non-iconic aspects aligned with the regulation of the universal postal use. On April 1st, 1878, Argentina had become a member of the General Postal Union. Although Argentina was not represented at the Bern Congress of 1874, where the General Postal Union was established, in September 1875, Dr. von Stefan sent the minutes of the Bern Congress to the minister in Paris, Mariano Valcarce and request Argentina's adherence. Balcarce was Minister Plenipotentiary, representative of the Argentine Republic in France, and to highlight his importance, son-in-law of General José de San Martín, liberator of Argentina, Chile, and Peru. The general director of postal offices and telegraphs, Eduardo Oliveira, agreed to the request and maintained correspondence with von Stefan. It should be noted that Oliveira was responsible for merging the post office and telegraphs into a single institution. The first article of the Paris Convention in 1978, established that all member nations configure one postal territory with the aim of guaranteeing the reciprocal exchange of correspondence. This originated two fundamental outcomes. On the one hand, freedom of transit. On the other hand, unification of postal rates and the prohibition of tariffs which had not been authorized by the organization. Argentina's incorporation into Bern's Postal Convention is regarded as the most relevant event after the implementation of postage stamps. Since it could make available to all Argentinian residents safe, easy communication with countries all over the world. However, for the Second Postal Congress to be held in Paris in May of that year, Eduardo Rivera, General Direc Director of Postal Offices and Telegraphs, suggests that the change in rates proposed by Switzerland and France be revised. His initiative rested in the fundamental understanding that low rates always mean an increase in revenue which the Argentinian administrator expressed. Among the arguments built by Oliveira, by Oliveira against universalization, we might highlight the scarce population in vast desert areas and a lack of habit regarding epistolary communication issued their education. To bolster his arguments, he compared 
the number of inhabitants per square kilometer in Belgium, 183, England, 152, and Argentina, a half. And the convention agreed to his request. Likewise, this paper attempts to point out some of the futures of that centralizing intent of the budding Argentinian state, a process not without contradiction in permanent motion, the product of negotiation which were, we were hardly ever simple, whose protagonists are the agreement with between countries in the region, in turn penetrated by longer-term supranational and regional objectives. Considering that context, a set of documents will be tackled, which allow to recover the multidimensional nature, nature of that debate, technical aspects of the execution of the regulation, the hybrid character regarding the diplomatic aspects and the circulation of a specific postal and telegraphic knowledge of postal congresses and epistolary exchange, which consolidated UPUS in U Union Postal, uh, U UPU intangible, intangible network, the field booklets of the technicians and the postal strikes of 1888. It's been a paper. It's been a paper presented at the Prato Congress. We focus on the transformation of imaginaries and narratives of space and time to three aspects correlated with this work. They were the political project of the province of Corrientes, which issued the considered first postage stamp in the Argentine territory when the Argentine Republic was not yet constituted. Its iconographic affiliation, the French source, was an expression of the national model of the Prophesi Professionalization through the creation of the National School of Postal and Telegraph Engineers of the Argentine Republic, configuration of the simononic sociability and visual imaginary through various postal artifacts that allow immigrants to show visual reference of their new country of residence, the development of collecting and an incipient foreign industry. For the Universal Postal Union, conformity to international parameters, parameters not only mean gaining visibility by means of the development of South American postal conventions held with Uruguay and Paraguay or the exhibition of instruments and plates both at the continental and international level. It also involved understanding how images circulated at an unprecedented rate in catalogs, albums, periodical publications, postcards, and among stamp collectors, very active agents in the exchange of knowledge relating to postal administration. Likewise, we, we are interested in accounting for the knowledge exchanges generated by the invisible network around the UPU, UPU expressed in regional and supranational agreements. Likewise, here we have the text of that, those agreements. Likewise, to address the conflict that is no present, we want, we would like to address the conflict that is not present in the official documents through other sources. 
in this context of the search for unification and externalization due to transnationalization, we have an artifact, a field notebook, and field notes from the expedition to install the telegraph line in Rawson, which reflects various aspects of that process. The calendar, measurement, and leap time. The leap time reveal differences uh, from the official account. Here's a letter from the Julio Oliveira archive. Dear Oliveira, it's the time, it's raining, and I, and I spend my time writing to kill the black sorrow, to top it all off. I have to vegetate career because I can't work due to lack of materials. If it rains, you will get wet. If those needs, you will get damp. If it can, you will shine. The uh, B side of the official account. Illustrations and cartoons of the postal workers drive due to the imposition of the uniform in 1888. I will bond my side, my suit, in the presence of the executioners. America is a land of the free, not of slaves. Jose Coreleu eh, is an anarchist worker eh, from Spain who lived in Argentina. To finish, and also it exceeds the period uh, covered in this work, I want to show um, the iconographic record of the Universal Postal Congress held in Buenos Aires, Argentina in 1939. Material size in postal objects and a volume published by Ramon Columba containing illustrated portraits of the represented representatives attending the event. It reflects Argentina's growing interest in maintaining the Universal Postal Union network and also serve as a small preview of online web conference platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we still have uh, eight minutes for one or two questions. Perhaps if you may introduce yourself, si vous pouvez vous présenter. If you could introduce yourselves, please. I would like to ask to our American uh, uh, contributors today why the fate of the U.S. Postal Savings uh, Bank was uh, different uh, compared to uh, to the fate of the parcel U.S. Parcel, US parcel Post. Eventually, the U.S. Parcel Post uh, um, exists, but uh, the role of USPS in postal financial services has been severely limited. Uh, from uh, 1907, if I understand well, beginning of the, the 20th century. So why, do, would you have an explanation in terms of comparative analysis of why this fate for parcels, but the different uh, uh, end of the story for the postal savings in the US? Thank you very much. Thank you. Stefan, or oh, perhaps if you met, or oh, Stefan, you, if you prefer. Yes. Yes, I could. Uh, I could okay, say, 
um, postal banking ended in the 1960s, um, the initiative was primarily for um, geared towards immigrants to the United States who were familiar with postal banking in their home countries. And as the the uh, country became uh, less, more homogenized, the demand for that sort of banking, and it was not full service banking, it was a savings program. It didn't offer checking or credit cards. Uh, that's my take. Perhaps Richard has some other input. Yeah, just please. Yeah, please. That's right, it was actually a proposal. Uh, there is our uh, law professor who's trying to revive the postal banking today. Immigrant, European background, is a Republican program, not a Democrat. Microphone, please. Spot by Republican support. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everything Stephen said is right. Um, there's been a proposal to revive it. Elizabeth Warren. Massachusetts senators behind that. It was a Republican initiative. Um, ferocious lobbying against it by the banking industry, which is in some ways analogous to the lobbying against Parcel Post. Um, the interesting question is why does the one succeed and the other fail? Uh, breakdown and resistance to banking. Banking was boring in the United States in the 1950s, so it was seen as safe. That's not necessarily the case today. There's a very large unbanked population in the United States that's confronted with predatory lending, so it'd be a rationale to bring back a postal banking. But opposition of uh, uh, banks, and as Stephen said, the inability to get into new services because of how tightly the sector was constrained. I think it may be hard for Europeans to understand just how uh, the mandate of government regulatory agencies in the United States is constrained by the power of, of power of private lobbies. But it's it's a very good question. You might then ask why was not Parcel Post eliminate the United States and you have powerful domestic groups behind it. Um, but the uh, powerful domestic groups behind postal savings were uh, not as strong as those that opposed them. So that's what we got. It's a good question. One, two. Okay, so I would like on your behalf to thank our three speakers. And uh, I'll call uh, the chair of the next session, Monsieur Mathieu Gilabert. Mathieu Gilabert is invited to come to the lectern. Thank you. So welcome to this last panel and uh, our last uh, panelist. I'm uh, Mathieu Gilabert. I'm professor at University of Fribourg in Switzerland, not so far away from here. And uh, I promise that we will launch some new research about UPU uh, as we have uh, heard today. 
Euh, nous avons entendu aujourd'hui des présentations sur les enjeux euh, techniques. The man, so we've heard the various presentations today, some of them technical, relating to the sovereignty of uh, countries uh, that were dominated uh, and to legitimize uh, uh, that in the case of uh, Japan. We've also seen presentations on uh, the pressure of imperial powers in the, the development of communication spaces and the UPU each time appears as a an organization with uh, technical skills, uh, but of course uh, also working in the realm of politics. Uh, I will be relatively strict uh, uh, with uh, the management of the time available to us. Uh, each of you will have 15 minutes uh, for your presentation. In the case of uh, this uh, panel, we're going to talk about uh, postal policies, uh, and uh, the role of UPU to foster transnational exchanges, but also the importance of uh, treaties uh, with respect uh, to uh, the uh, definition of nation states and their importance. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, decolonization and postal politics, uh, sovereignty in the stamps of uh, pseudo states in sub Saharan Africa. 1961-1980, Gary Baines, uh, History Department, Rhodes University, uh, South Africa, who's going to talk to us about uh, this uh, topic. So you are a professor of uh, history at Rhodes University, uh, specialized in South African border wars uh, and uh, urban history and culture. You have the floor, dear colleague. Thank you and good afternoon. I guess by the um, small number of questions asked in the previous session, um, our tension is flagging. Um, we'll try to get it back on track. Okay, the essential thesis of my paper is that um, international um, postal system is inherently political. Um, and I'm going to try illustrate this argument with reference to case studies of three secessionist or unilaterally illegal states in Africa during the period of decolonization of the early 1960s. And to set the scene, um, I need to make a few comments about sovereignty and secession and what I've chosen to call pseudo-states, which are, I will define, as you can see from the first slide, please. Um, okay, we all know that the uh, UPU is a specialized agency of the United Nations, and it follows the lead of that body in declaring or rec recognizing or not states that are Thank you. Legal or not. In other words, if the United Nations deems a regime to be illegitimate, the UPU follows suit. When the Organization of Africa was founded in 1963, it committed member states to preserve the territorial integrity of the con continent's colonial boundaries. And it opposed the recognition of new states through succession, I mean, through secession. In other words, this was uh, deemed necessary to uh, avoid uh, chaotic decolonization to preserve the colonial boundaries. So the, the post-colonial states adopted the same uh, political makeup. Um, and of course, it has been a bone of contention in Africa ever since. Um, the common standpoint of the United Nations and the OAU contributed then to an international climate against secessionism. And this was also in keeping with the norms of sovereignty during this period. Now, as I've indicated, the 
case studies that I'm going to turn to are three that are sought to try attain sovereign status and independence by breaking away from their mother countries. Um, the three case studies being Katanga, which broke away from the Republic of Congo, Leopoldville, Biafra, which attempted to secede from Nigeria, and Rhodesia, which is somewhat different in that it sought to uh, sever ties with Whitehall. But in, in a sense, they, they have certain uh, similarities and, and can be compared. And people have used, or well, scholars have used different terms to describe these, this category of states. And I, as I've indicated, I've chosen to use the term pseudo-state, which is defined on, on the slide. I won't read it. Other uh, scholars have also used uh, terms like proto-state or quasi-state as well. Um, I see slight differences in these uh, meanings and terminologies, but essentially what I think one can say um, of these kinds of states is that they make claims to be sovereign nations, okay? They issue stamps, for example, to assert sovereignty. Um, I haven't found any information in the archives to suggest that they applied for UPU membership. Um, but again, that would, if that happened, it would be a means to assert sovereignty. Um, but sovereignty is a discursive claim. As such, it is contingent, it, it is con contested. And of course, stamps only are invested with sovereignty if they are accepted as a valid receipt for prepayment of postage on a reciprocal basis with other states. And of course, as I'll illustrate in this um, presentation, that didn't happen. Okay, um, I've got I, a map for those who are unaware of the um, location of Katanga on the eastern uh, part of, of Congo, uh, now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo, then just simply Congo Republic. It was granted independence by Belgium in 1960. Um, it was the mineral rich area of the eastern uh, parts of Katanga um, that declared independence under its leadership of uh, self styled. Uh, Moise Chombi in uh, July of 1960. Um, but it was not recognized by other countries. Um, and eventually, its short existence came to an end when the United Nations forces, um, commonly known as ONAC, um, defeated Katang. The, Katangi's gendarmes and the uh, military forces in, in that region, and Shambi was pressed into signing a treaty of uh, conciliation. In other words, its sovereignty, if you like, was denied by virtue of uh, intervention by the United Nations. Um, I have to, as I say, provide just very brief um, potted histories of these regions, but just to set some kind of context. Moving on to Biafra, Biafra attempted to secede from the Nigerian Federation in 1967 under the leadership of Lieutenant uh, Colonel Amjukwu, uh, who declared independence of, of from Nigeria and uh, called in what became known as the Biafran Republic on the 30th 30th of May 1967. It too, like Katanga, was potentially rich in resources and um, oil had been recently discovered and promised to bring a bit of a, a revenue bonanza um, to um, Nigeria and of course um, the Biafran's the political elite at any rate in Biafra 
hope to uh, benefit from uh, such revenue. Um, the world at large refused to recognize Biafra. Um, however, there were five countries that did so, and four of them happened to have been in um, Africa, including one of its neighbors, Gabon, near neighbors, Gabon. Um, eventually, the Biafran Rebellion um, also um, was defeated, but um, this time by the federal forces, not by outside intervention, except to say that, of course, by, uh, the, um, the Nigerian Federation did receive external aid from the former mother country, um, Britain, but also, uh, in, interestingly, Russia, or the, what was then the Soviet Union, a, a very unlikely uh, partnership. And thirdly, if I may move to, oh, sorry, that is right, to the white settler state of Rhodesia, which declared UDI in 1965, as I've already stated, um, it didn't attempt to redraw boundaries, but to sever ties with um, London, with Whitehall. Um, of course, uh, Louise White has famously said that um, Rhodesia was more of a cause in the country. Its population was very mobile, uh, the white settler population at any rate. Um, and the Smith regime attempted to uphold white supremacy and construct a Rhodesian Biafran, <laughs> Rhodesian British identity um, as part of the, the Rhodesian Front's, the ruling Rhodesian Front's political agenda. However, of course, um, it wasn't accepted by Britain, which still regarded Rhodesia uh, and used the name Southern Rhodesia, still regarded Rhodesia as a colony, an illegal um, secession of state, or U, um, they didn't use the term UDI, they didn't accept the term UDI, instead they used the term IDI, which means illegal declaration of independence. So that, that was the, the stance of officialdom um, in, and the, the Wilson government at that time. Of course, eventually Rhodesia became in, embroiled in a civil war, a long protracted civil war, um, which saw the um, Smith regime eventually surrender power and hand back uh, the state to Britain, who, who arranged for a transition to majority rule. Now, as I say, each of these states, or, or would-be states, aspirant states, if you like, um, issued stamps to assert their sovereignty. And I'm just um, referencing here the independence stamps that they issued, just to exemplify the symbolism involved in asserting this sovereignty. Um, on the first anniversary of independence, Katanga issued this set of three stamps, the three denominations, um, all with the same design. And as you can see from the slide, um, in the upper right left corner, a portrait of Chombe. Um, the date in the uh, green diagonal band of independence, and then in the lower right um, band, um, the handa, as they were called, these are crosses which had traditional uh, symbolism in the um, region of. Um, Katanga. Some believed it was associated with um, mineral wealth, but more likely um, it has to do as much with traditional crafts and so on. Um, in addition, you'll note that a surcharge was added to these stamps, and, and this money presumably went into Chombi's war uh, chest. In the case of Biafra, um, the independence stamps issued uh, some time, about eight months after the claim to independence or to sovereignty was made. Um, the two penny value shows the 
map of Biafra with the sun prominent, as you'll see in all three stamps, and because it was part of the uh, Biafran flag. Um, the two penny value also shows a map of Africa with a, in the insert, which pinpoints the location of Biafra, which suggests that the target audience or the intended audience for these stamps was uh, a, a broad palatalist and um, foreign sympathizers, lobbyists, and so on. Um, but there's a bit of a Amb ambiguity here because the value of the stamp would only have been good for for local postage and of course for the most part as we'll see these stamps were used only locally but uh, the use of them uh, further afield abroad became a highly contentious issue um, these four penny value just shows the date of independence and the one shilling value portrays a mother and a child gazing upwards towards the, the rising sun, uh, which is an emblem that the Biafans seem to have uh, stolen from the Japanese um, to uh, depict new beginnings and bright futures. Okay. One, I should just add that this image of the Biafran child or the Biafran babies, of course, became so synonymous with the war. Um, the great suffering and the loss of life that was inflicted during the course of the war, and in particularly, uh, particular the image of the the child with uh, Kwashi. Uh, this is a word I, I struggle to pronounce. Kwashi you call, which is uh, the symptom of um, malnutrition. Um, this became a humanitarian crisis. And in effect, in the public imagination, Biafra wasn't seen as a nascent a nation, a nation, an aspirant nation, but rather a, a, a humanitarian affair. And um, that, of course, detracted from any claims to sovereignty that it might have had. Lastly, just to illustrate the Rhodesian case, um, its independence stamp, which was Unlike um, the case of Biafra, where stamps were uh, um, produced abroad, uh, Rhodesia produced its own stamps. Um, and the design on the independence two and six, uh, two, two shilling sixpence stamp, um, the emblems are quite, or the symbols are quite self evident on the uh, Left-hand side, one sees the coat of arms um, of Rhodesia, including part of the uh, heraldry drawn from um, the Rhodes um, fa family, or Cecil John Rhodes, who is regarded as the uh, founder of the nation, or the white nation at any rate. Um, and then to show the continuity with the colonial administration, there's the head of Queen Elizabeth the second, who Rhodesians claimed was their monarch. They didn't recognize the, and I finished my time, sorry, they didn't recognize the, um, the Labour government, but they were trying to say uh, she was the, her queen. Okay, sorry, I've totally run out of time. I was going to also show uh, some of the postal uh, sanctions that were imposed upon these states, but we'll have to call it the day there. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. C'est très passionnant en plus de travailler sur des sources très originales pour uh, cette histoire. Thank you very much. Very original. We now have a second presentation, a more general presentation on the necessary conditions for international collaboration within the uh, UPU by Hideki Sato, macro, micro, and long-term perspectives to the UPU. Uh, Hideki Sato is professor for, of international finance in the Faculty of Economics and Management at Kanazawa University in Japan and associate staff member of the Financial Market Group at the London School of Economics. Please, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General. Thank you very much, as uh, a staff of the IB of the EBU. Thank you for everyone for preparation for a uh, great conference in advance. My name is Hideki Sato. As uh, a second Monsieur to pronounce it, my eighth sound a he. So uh, all of a French person says to cut the a ash. So that I'm just like Hideki. So that I always correct my name. So thank you, Monsieur. So uh, my presentation uh, focus on macro, micro, and long-term perspective to the EPU, the three dimensions for international harmonization. <laughs> so uh, the fund my fundamental question is, what's the focal points to understand the importance of cross-border cooperation to have an efficacious, uh, efficient system of postal services? The presentation will be based on three uh, points, namely macro perspective, micro perspective, and long term perspective. So, of course, our historical aspects uh, methodology is based on the long term perspective uh, over 150 years. But the macro uh, important thing is is a very important and a um very some kind of the conf a lot of conflicts or compromise between the member states. So in that means that to divide line between the micro perspective and macro perspective. So my question is how to harmonize the international organization. Uh, this is a commonality, not only the UPU, but also the, any kind of the UN uh, committees in, or uh, um, by the committee on banking supervision as well. Is a uh, lot of commonality to divide in line. Oh, what is our minimized standardized approach and what is uh, to make a leeway for discretional approach remain in member states? So background for conclusion, uh, even though the current status in 2024 should be different from the historical experiences. So we have a serious mission to pave the way to thrive as a service provider in tandem with the competition with private sectors. Uh, we are community with uh, privatization, not only Japan, but also the UK or a uh, lot of countries uh, switching from also relative sector to the privatization to compete with, uh, for example, the DHL or same, any kinds of private sectors. This is a very impeding point for us. Therefore, services, competition, speed, accuracy, assurance, and indispensable to enact the reliable and high quality services among member states. In the sense of free and open discussion in the EPU, including formal and informal approach, should be necessitated. As for macro perspective, the EPU are focused on features of EPU with respect to international harmonization, but raised by the macro perspective. For example, in order to forge international cooperation for personal services, it's not easy task to, to, con to discern to what is the subject should be standardized and what issue should be a leeway for member states, as I mentioned. So I oftentimes uh, visit a postal service, uh, postal museum in London uh, so many times, including in the exhibition for the, is a very activating for not only professional, but uh, also the uh, children's and the very activate in the very friendly manner, in a sense. So as for the post 33 uh, as part one, is a universe, uh, Congress Universal in the uh, London in London Congress in 1929. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting point about the, um, the discourse by the Henri Charon and Secretary, the Minister of Commerce and Industry, the post a telegraphic to France. So in 1928 was a preparation for the 1929th Congress is our, his discourse should be uh, emphasized about the leak condition, the different regime. So it's a very important point uh, at the time of 1929. So uh, it's a so might diversitize a regime for, comp it's a complication intolerable for the execution of the implementation on in terms of uh, service postal. So it's a, long lasting issue, not only the 29th, but also the 2024. <laughs> of course, uh, as we know, our uh, first con conference was held in 15 September, 1984 in Berlin, uh, but the uh, preparation are also very 
substantive point about the two 1863 uh, uh, the commission uh, held in Paris. Uh, the authority uh, contract to union on the law uh, was to a uh, synod of October meal with some, so some can. So, uh, so this input, um, I have a strong interest about the, what's the um, combination between the relationship between France, Switzerland, and Germany. Because to delve into the documentation of the archives, uh, as, uh, is a lot of Congress uh, about the following the Washington, Rome, and the Madrid and Stockholm. Stockholm is very important. 1924 is an epoch making to um, efficacious point to effective make effective the postal services before the 1929. But another thing is a principle. So this is a, also the immunable. Principle yeah, because uh, solidarity under the na nation is very substantial point is uh, to unite. Uh, even though it's uh, so many differentiated approach uh, to the postal services uh, before the enactment of 1974, and so including progress uh, a routine and the routine issues and the uh, some kind of the difficult things of fiscal or some kind of the frontier, circulation of idea frontiers. But the, another one is uh, time consuming. So we have to should write on not only the accuracy, but of the speeding delivery service as well. But uh, very huge uh, purposes is to contract about the peace of every member states as a whole. So, of course, uh, even though the uh, 1970s are very important watershed to enact uh, effectiveness, uh, but uh, prior to the 1970s is also important. So I have an interest about uh, not only uh, just uh, bureaucratic services, but also imperialism, um, colonialism, or and commercialism as well. So as for the general uh, postal union, uh, this is a photo in the postal museum in London. It's very, some kind of uh, easy to fragile. So we have to take care of the one place, one to another place. It's a very beautiful uh, ambience. So this is a 1978 uh, French, uh, French initiative for the Convention of the Paris. So, in the archives, uh, I have to learn about the domination of Mon um, Union Postal Service Article 6 means uh, to um, clarify about the role of Bureau and Inter International Union. So the function is the function is uh, very important. First of all, the high quality of surveillance. Another way is, is uh, how to handle ways uh, administration of the union. Of course, the uh, bureau is uh, uh, some kind of cascading down about the 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century as well. Uh, but the decision making also complicated. But the principle is the majority absolute they work. So this is a very simple, but uh, some kind of the symmetric system or as asymmetric system as well. So as for micro, uh, micro perspective to the UPU, I have to shed right on the UK as well as Japan as well. So the British postal uh, survive, uh, this type of services is uh, around 1512, is a Henry Ace appoints Sabrian Duke as master of the posts. And 1661, Henry Bishop, Master General introduces the world's first postmark. This is very interesting. So documents, are, it is very fragile to, uh, we have to take care of it, but uh, beautiful uh, documentation of London 20, uh, 1929. So about the micro perspective, so there is some complication uh, between the approach, for example, the German administration proposed uh, more simplified the system. 
is a bureaucratic level. Uh, for example, uh, the present method is a uh, radar in convention and the detail regulation give rise to very considerable trouble and difficulty. This is a point of making about the, the, what is the crux, crux of matter, but it's hardly possible to arrive with any degree of certainty of a real, uh, of a realist representative figure. So the German scheme of proposal is more simplified, such as and the, the amount of and the weight of the parcel, so the up to five kilograms and the five to fifteen kilograms and the fifteen to thirty kilograms, uh, to the range of the three um, three levels. But uh, um, as the host countries, the UK propose and the compromise about our critique about that this this was too they are too high and this is suggested a more uh, moderate weight such as uh, uh, to be told to the accurate two point five kilograms in the first range but the the support part figure is the three kilograms ten kilograms and twenty kilograms so uh, this is a compromising version of the UK's countermeasures to react to the German approach. As for well, uh, putty, uh, putty paquet, so is a several kind of the variation between the and uh, among Japan, France, and Germany for the fifty grams of twenty uh, twenty cents uh, to ten cents as well. As for well, it's a very precise of so the minimum rate of minimum minimum rate or dim dimensions are different, and the transit rates are also different. And the three and uh, the four main clauses of proposal. Uh, should be proposal for abolishing transit rates or a general proposal regarding the method of taking statistics. So the two horizontal line, the equal footing of the statistical data is very important. This is not only the U UPU problem, but also another in institutional uh, organization of United Nations as well. So as for the Tokyo Congress in the 1969 to jumping forward, uh, 40 years later, the Congress of Tokyo, to be terse, the emphasis point is CCPS. So, to clarify about the um, union bodies, not, not uh, the, some kind of weakness of the committee to the uh, updating about the to strengthen from committee to council, so consultative council for process studies. So studies means or is a very pertinent to the academic levels. We are on the same page about to make a very detailed analyze and to uh, analyze and detail. But the important thing is who is making as a final decision. So it is very complicated about the issue, but the study is very important so not only the analysis but also the practical tools for the handling of upu so to learn more quickly about the cps decision and the study finding is very necessitated point so the documentation and results of the ccp studies should be emphasized at the tokyo congress as well so let's skip to the itu approach and the Last one is a long-term approach. So I'd like to pose a question about the three dichotomy. The first one is diversity versus integration. Next one is soft law or non-binding approach versus hard law or jurisdictional approach. Last one is discretion versus convergence. So there are a strong commonality, not only the uh, UPU, but the, all of the uh, international organization, including the Committee. So another point is to maximize cost effectiveness and competitive phenomenon, how to strive such as a current status should be concluded as three points. First one is competition. So in tandem with the privatization of our postal sectors, we have to compatible between the competition and speed. It's a, this is a commonality between the rising cost of employees, it's an inflation pressure, the macroeconomic situation, even so in Germany as well, is reducing about the manpower for manipulating, even so AI is developed. 
but the accuracy and the reliable services is a land of last, last resort. So we have to have a credence for postal services. So in a sense, the UPU have a vital role for uh, the usage of 150 years accumulation of experiences. So I'd like to thank you very much and the great uh, contribution for the interview in advance. Thank you. Merci pour avoir aussi respecté parfaitement le, le temps à partie. Et nous Thank avons you very much for having stuck to the time that was allotted to you. Thank you for giving us uh, these uh, different uh, analyses. Uh, I will now give the floor to Etienne Morales, whose presentation echoes uh, the first contribution that we heard. Uh, he will be coming back to the political dimension of postal services uh, and will look into solutions when postal services are interrupted. What are the challenges which uh, states in such situations have to face? Uh, we'll have uh, the example of the Cold War and the tensions between Cuba and the USA with this contribution, airmail and revolutionary Cuba between embargo and bypass routes, 1960s and 1970s. Etienne Morales uh, wrote a PhD, Cuba and the World, uh, recalling uh, that uh, airlines and, and postal services uh, are very closely linked. He received a distinction for his PhD. Etienne, you have the floor for 15 minutes. Bonjour à toutes et bonsoir à toutes et tous. Plutôt, euh, je voudrais Good afternoon, one and all. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of uh, this colloquium, especially the International Bureau of the Universal Postal Union, who has uh, invited us here, as well as uh, the Scientific Committee, Leonard Labori, who invited me to speak here, uh, not only about uh, uh, airlines, uh, which is my field of specialty, but to, to take up uh, other issues that are not really in my area of specialty, strictly speaking. By means of an introduction, I'd like uh, to talk about uh, a document, which you can see at the Cuban Postal Museum. You see uh, a replica of uh, the monument of the uh, European Postal Union. It's an envelope from 1971 uh, that went to show that uh, air mail between the United States uh, and Cuba transited uh, through Spain. In my con contribution, I will be telling you about the postal embargo around Cuba in the early 1960s and the strategies that were put in place to circumvent, to circumvent this embargo. Uh, there was uh, a postal blockade uh, around Cuba, but the presence of this envelope uh, at the Cuban Postal Museum goes to show that there were solutions to circumvent uh, this uh, embargo. Uh, I'd like to go back uh, to the development of airmail after the Second World War. It started with Pan American Airways, uh, which was the first uh, airline uh, link between Key West uh, and Havana. Ever since, Pan American Airways developed its network in Latin America through postal contracts. Uh, it had a monopoly in Latin America up till 1945. This monopoly finished after the Second World War. And with regard to Cuba, it's uh, a company called Expresso Aero Inter Americano that uh, won a contract uh, for postal services between Havana and Miami. Opening up uh, to competition made it possible to decrease prices. Airmail uh, went from $4 per pound to $0.08 cents per pound. It is uh, now possible uh, to send mail through airmail. Air post traffic statistics of that time go to show that there is a 
huge increase. So you see a diagram which shows in red inter-American uh, air pollution traffic uh, and in orange, uh, transatlantic and transpacific air post traffic, which doesn't increase quite as much. Now, this increase in volume is uh, goes hand in hand with a decrease uh, in price, and therefore sources of income have to be diversified. Mail, which used to be the basis for their turnover between uh, the two world wars, this uh, source of income decreases in favor of passenger and fret. Postal relations by air between the USA and Cuba, uh, the, these two countries have a, a particular relationship uh, ever since uh, 1898, but following the Second World War, the link between Miami and Havana is the main air freight link for the United States. This is where most freight goes to from the United States. So there is a huge dichotomy when it comes to air mail in terms of volume. There are usually more, three times more letters going to Cuba compared to letters, uh, out, uh, outgoing letters from Cuba. Another major destination is Spain at the time, with the opening up in 1947 of the first uh, airmail service, postal airmail service. Uh, that's a major break. Uh, if we think of the colonial history of uh, the Spanish Empire, it only takes 24 hours to go from Spain to Cuba. Iberia and Cuba de Aviación shared the market. Uh, so a Spanish uh, company and a Cuban company, airmail frequency matched the frequency of uh, flights. You see an um, advertisement here for the Cuban company, which uh, shows the exchange of mail uh, in the context of migration. There's still quite a few uh, Spanish people living in Cuba, and here you see uh, on the advertisement someone opening a letter that comes from the other side of the world. At that time, and before the revolution, under the presidency of Sugratsuga Batin, and uh, especially under uh, the presidency of Batista, Postal contracts uh, are the opportunity to receive uh, uh, hidden subsidies. Under Batista, a Cuban company received $50,000 in subsidies underhand, whereas the total cost uh, of postal services is $150,000. So it's an underhand manner to support business in the hand of his uh, cronies. Now, the idea is to moralize uh, the economy at the turn of 1961. Now, coming back to uh, the postal embargo around Cuba, things went south for Cuba around the summer of 1960 when Cuba decided to nationalize uh, uh, oil refineries. American companies present in Cuba, and that's when uh, there started being problems uh, in uh, the dispatch uh, of airmail and the press. It was one of the tasks of uh, postal services uh, to send uh, newspapers and the press. Uh, they were considered as propaganda and were therefore destroyed in American airports and uh, Latin America airports. Uh, Enrique Olduski, the Minister of Communications in Cuba, said we are under attack uh, even when it comes uh, to uh, uh, letters and airmail. Uh, but then came uh, the missile crisis for a few weeks. Uh, Cuba was uh, cut off from the rest of the world. This is something that we see 
Uh, when we look at uh, the dispatches uh, from diplomats, diplomats can still send uh, telegrams, uh, but uh, the diplomatic pouch uh, cannot circulate. Uh, let us say you will read this whenever you can. And a, a, story, a Hugh Thomas, a, a historian from Britain, said that the most important aspect of uh, the missile crisis for Cubans is uh, the fact that Pan Am flights were interrupted between Cuba and the USA. In October 1962, Cubans no longer have any solution to leave Cuba and uh, mail, which still circulated despite the severing of diplomatic relationship between Cuba and the United States, uh, no longer flows directly. At this stage, uh, the Cuban Chancellery receives a telegram uh, from uh, the Postal Union from the, of the Americas and Spain, inviting it to a conference to which it had not been invited. It received it uh, by mistake. At the same time, right around 1962, Cuba had been uh, uh, excluded from uh, OEA. Now here you have an excerpt of the letter of the time, um, mocking uh, the Postal Union of the Americas and Spain, uh, which uh, just follows uh, instructions from uh, the State Department in the USA and follows uh, uh, a long piece from a former guerrillero uh, attacking the United States uh, and uh, defending uh, the uh, inalienable right to uh, communicate uh, and uh, criticizing economic sanctions. At this point in time, when uh, direct lines were interrupted, it is mainly uh, Iberia, which is in charge of uh, flights between Spain and Cuba, continue to uh, um, to fly uh, passengers uh, and uh, airmail, but no longer transports freight. It uh, says uh, that it continues uh, to uh, transport and dispatch uh, parcels for humanitarian purposes as well as exiles. Uh, Cuba tries uh, to circumvent the embargo by opening other uh, lines uh, to Nassau, for example, in the Bahamas, uh, an agreement, a pre-revolution agreement, allows Cuba to have uh, 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 lines, but measures are taken to prevent passengers uh, to get off planes. Um, one ton uh, that comes out of these flights may continue to the United States. Demonstrations are organized and therefore the line is uh, interrupted. There may have been uh, an intervention by the Cuban government at the uh, Universal Postal Union to um, criticize this fact. I didn't have time to make any research, but there doesn't seem to be any request uh, in this regard. I looked at what happened at the uh, IKO and IKO and at the UPU. Um, Cuba criticizes neo-colonialist stance, but not the embargo directly. Également, d'autres types de mesures à Cuba. There are other measures uh, that are coupled with the embargo. There are many examples of uh, checking mail. Here's one on the screen. It is the link between embargo and uh, checking the mail. François uh, Mitterrand uh, traveled to Cuba at the time, and in uh, the letter that he sent to Anne Pajot at the time, he, he sent a postcard where nothing was uh, written, and then uh, from uh, Guadeloupe, uh, he sent uh, a letter with the uh, news uh, saying that uh, from Cuba it was not possible uh, to uh, send any mail because uh, the fact uh, that the mail was checked. With the end of uh, direct flights in 1963, there were certain schemes uh, that uh, 
were developed, uh, medication, food, clothes were sent by parcel from the states uh, via third countries, uh, uh, not uh, subject to an embargo. And I'm trying to move ahead as quickly as I can because time is running out and time is of the essence. And this is a postcard from 1962. We see that there's an internalization of a parcel post by consumers from Cuba and Florida. And uh, we see that uh, it is possible to send objects of a very little value, like chewing gum for less than 10 pesos, so it was possible to send that via uh, parcel into Cuba. And in 1968, uh, there was a parcel that exploded in Havana at the Ministry of Telecommunications as it was being handled. This is an anti-Castro magazine and uh, uh, the idea here is to send uh, a parcel with a bomb to Fidel Castro so this uh, possibility of sending parcels was immediately suspended at the time because of this incident uh, and uh, thousands of parcels have started accumulating in various airports including in Europe uh, including a uh, Madrid airport and here, parcels are suspended, play on words with uh, suspended for Cuban people in exile. And everything was controlled, uh, the content of the parcel, the weight of the parcel. In uh, the 1970s, uh, there's an improvement in the circulation of letters and uh, parcels. So there are new air uh, services, new uh, flights are open after the end of uh, or the lifting of certain uh, sanctions uh, by the Organization Afri of American States. Um, and if we compare the pre-revolution uh, levels with uh, the 1970s, 140 tons in 1957, prior to the revolution, and uh, more than 850 tons of mail in 1970. So we see that uh, uh, the uh, flow of mail uh, grew significantly over that period, but uh, the lack of direct relationship between Cuba and the United States, and I'm talking about postal relations, uh, this existed until 2016. And uh, Barack Obama visited uh, Cuba at the time and decided to revive uh, the direct postal relations uh, between uh, the U.S. administration and Cuba after a long period of uh, no relations at all. It was a resumption of a uh, direct mail uh, between Cuba and the USA. So, oh yes, I've been told to stop my presentation, but I'm nearing the end. So the opening of mail, all of that seized, um, parcels with bombs, um, this is also something that is seized in terms of uh, our political economics, of course, so this uh, uh, can be analyzed, uh, and I can tell you that uh, in Cuba, this is uh, considered as something that can lead to speculation and counterfeit goods, uh, as something that is uh, considered as uh, uh, being an attack against uh, the uh, freedom of movement of goods, in particular of mail. And it was uh, considered uh, to be a form of trade with uh, uh, Fidel Castro and his regime. And we know that there have been uh, various uh, concrete arrangements uh, that have made it possible to keep alive uh, these uh, very important postal uh, relations. Thank you, and sorry for having overshot uh, the time that was allotted to me.
Thank you for this uh, presentation. We now come uh, to the last uh, presentation. We're going to listen to Rajiv Venugopal, uh, Canada Post uh, Corporation, Canada, who's going to speak to us from Canada. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. And can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, Rayef uh, Venugopal uh, is uh, a general manager of international relations at uh, Post Canada. Il a aussi travaillé uh, au gouvernement. He has also worked uh, in the New Brunswick government and also the, in the Canadian Senate. And he's uh, presenting a, a contribution entitled uh, Delivering Diplomacy, the Universal Postal Union's Role in a Post-Westphalian Global Order. Quite a title, a new dimension altogether. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some remarks. I do apologize for not being there in person and joining the conference virtually. I have spent a lot of time on that stage as well as on the floor in Bern over the past few years as Canada's head of delegation to the UPU. And of course, in this uh, Abidjan cycle as the co-chair of committee two of the Council of Administration. Um, quite honestly, earlier in my career, if someone had asked me about my thoughts on the global postal business, I probably would have shrugged my shoulders and had a blank look on my face. But these days, I must admit that the global postal business is not only my professional focus, it is an academic passion. It's been about 10 years since I've been in the classroom, and uh, I do miss this aspect of looking at the UPU and certainly looking at my work. Uh, quickly, for those of you in the Von Steffen room, uh, a few words, just enjoy the experience and breathe in its hallowed air deeply. The UPU is one of the great multilateral wonders of the world and a testament to the dream of a world in which multilateral governance and the single postal territory were once little more than ethereal, imaginary concepts and nothing more than fairy dust. I wanna thank the conference organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. And given that I have a deep and abiding disdain for PowerPoint, I have no slides. Now I am a political scientist by training and therefore world, view the world through the lens of power. Now, given that this is a historian's colloquium, I'm told that a political scientist is a cousin to historians. I was told, however, that economists were discouraged from applying and that accountants would have to pay a registration fee. Just, just kidding there. One of the formative events affecting modern geopolitics was the conclusion of the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which ended the 30 years and 80 years war that ravaged Europe. As a result of the creation of a new international order that displaced the rule of religious orders and the rule of kings, a global system of sovereign and border delineated independent states was born. In this system, states within their territories had exclusive use of coercion, of force, to ensure conformity with domestic laws. As applied to my interest and career in global postal affairs and having this colloquium convened, I was curious to better understand how the UPU operated in this system in which sovereignty was at the core of the international system but the UPU was afforded the opportunity to pursue its mandate for the most part as if those borders didn't really matter. Now, in this regard, I've tabled with the conference organizers a fairly lengthy conference paper. Um, I encourage all of you to not only read it, but comment critically. And I hope that my IB colleagues and member country colleagues, who I'll be seeing later in April for S5, will also have the opportunity to read the paper. My previous experience studying international relations and geopolitics involved challenge to multilateralism that one would associate with the travails of the UN Security Council, UN peacekeeping, and humanitarian intervention, where conflicting interests of sovereign states was de rigueur. When I joined the post, and specifically the international team, I was surprised to learn how global posts deliver items between one another as if sovereignty was not a barrier, and that it was a given that the union's members were aligned in pooling their sovereignty to achieve shared objectives. In 1874, as we've heard throughout this conference, 21 countries or entities came to Bern to align on terms and conditions under which they would exchange global, uh, globally postal items amongst and between their respective geographies. An agreement emerged that we would know as the Treaty of Bern, which would eventually result in the creation of the Universal Postal Union as we know today. 
At that 1874 table, there were multiple dynamics at play, including the significant influence of colonialism, the growing and waning of empires, and even resistance to some of the core principles that would later define the Union, including differences over freedom of transit. The first observation I had in writing my paper had to do with this apparent paradox between, on the one hand, an international order defined by individual sovereign states with borders, and on the other hand, the notion that borders were permeable in terms of the work of this specialized organization, a state made possible by its members agreeing to pool or share their sovereignty in order to achieve a common system. Such a trade-off, as one can imagine, would be very difficult to pull off unless strict terms were in place. Here, my second observation is that the UPU has been able to pursue its multilateral work given that it has worked hard over the years to stick to its lane, meaning that it sticks to issues within its postal, po per postal purview and generally avoids implicating itself and its members into sensitive areas such as territorial sovereignty, diplomacy, etc. Put another way, the incredible latitude that the UPU enjoys today is not being constrained by the, by the bonds of sovereignty or, or that the UPU enjoys this latitude is a function of its specificity. Of course, from time to time, temporal issues will rise to the fore, which motivate member countries to comment on those issues, particularly if they impact any aspect of postal exchange. To limit the diminishing of the postal focus of what would become the UPU, the US Postmaster General at the time, Montgomery Blair in 1862, called for a postal conference that would be attended later in Paris, led by postal experts and not the usual brand of diplomats that did not have postal expertise, but specialized in perhaps more general areas. My paper discusses various aspects of the union's creation and background considerations. In order to dig a little deeper into specific issues and understand how the UPU could balance its need to exist in a world defined by state sovereignty, while also having the great gift of being able to conduct its business across a single postal territory, my paper examined two specific areas, freedom of transit and one of the UN SDGs, SDG number five. With respect to the former, freedom of transit, the paper provides some history into how the concept evolved, but takes a specific look at recent changes to the customs regimes in place for Europe, specifically the impact of import control system release two, simply referred to as ICS2, and its application to the members of the European Union, which were 27, plus Norway, Switzerland, and Northern Ireland. Without delving into the technical matter that is explained in the paper, the main issue of contention appears that implementation of this new customs regime by the European Commission requires electronic data for postal items flowing to or through the previously named countries to be sent, acknowledged, and cleared electronically prior to the items being dispatched. Here is the idea that the new requirements would apply to items both destined to the EU and going through the EU, in other words, being transited to another destination country, which has been argued created an impediment for member countries trying to move items internationally across the single postal territory. Nearly all member countries from outside the EU believe that this is a violation of the freedom of transit principle and treats transit items in a prejudicial manner. What is driving much of the debate and contention has to do with understanding how UPU member countries' treaty obligations overlay with their obligations to the European Union and what to do regarding the philosophical conflict between the two concepts. Given that the European Union is governed as per the very same supranational governance construct that drives adherence to the rules and regulations of the UPU, it is not an easy philosophical nut to crack. What makes the issue even harder to grasp is the proliferation of other multilateral agreements, such as the GATT, which is now the WTO, the WCO, and ICAO agreements, that all contain provisions concerning freedom of transit and or principles of non-discrimination that member countries both in and outside the EU 27 plus three have agreed to. 
Notwithstanding the various efforts undertaken by the Director General, the International Bureau, and the bodies of the POC and the CA to work in a collaborative fashion with the European Commission to find a suitable outcome, the issue today remains delicate, as both multilaterally governed communities appear to have conflicting or at least apparent conflicting aims and objectives. Having said that, interviews that I conducted in the preparation of the paper seem to um, pardon me, the danger of having a mobile connection. Um, the um, interviews that I had conducted with subject matter experts from the European Commission, as well as designated postal operators from France, provided balanced input into how the issue is perceived by the European Union. Here, the third observation I have is that the UPU is located at the nexus and confluence of supranationalism and state sovereignty, management of the UPU, and the need to remain 100% focused on resolution of postal operational issues, which may become a proxy for complicated governance matters. With respect to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there is an emphasis on the implementation of 17 goals intended to serve the common benefit of humanity. One of them, SDG 5, relates to gender equality. Here we can see an excellent example of how sovereign member countries accept that the UPU has a role to play in pursuit of goals common to the UN system, while at the same time accepting that their inherent sovereignty accords them the right to retain deeply held domestic positions. In this case, two member countries had differing views on how gender equality policy should either include or exclude reference to LGBT rights or should be exclusive of them. Both countries, which had definitely differing points of view, raised their positions in open sessions of the Postal Operations Council delicately, but without prejudice or malignment of the others' points of view. Here, the fourth observation I wish to share with you relates to how important it is for the Union to deliver on its specialized and technical mandate, while at the same time navigating complex social issues that may involve deeply entrenched member country positions that are not subject to negotiation, or at least not subject to negotiation in real time on the floor of the room in which you're sitting today. In my curiosity regarding the intersection between member country sovereignty and the founding of the union, I was also curious as to whether creating the single postal territory was a uniquely normative and qualitative undertaking, or whether in the spirit of Morgenthau's realism, there were perhaps other motivations at play. Here the paper looks at several examples of how member country and empire interests may have been influenced in what would become the Treaty of Bern. And I think in the previous papers, there's been just some discussion on uh, Turkey's reasons and some of the diplomatic challenges they had in 1874 with regards to the Ottoman Empire. We understand that within the case of Japan, that there were certain geopolitical factors as well that informed itself um, in terms of joining the Union later on. Um, these are all uh, interesting aspects that I look at in the paper. As a political realist, it seems to me that in 1874, a confluence of complex geopolitical interests that Paul Kennedy discusses in the rise and fall of the great powers resulted in the original signatory seeking a way to maximize a few things, including acquisition of weapons, equipping of armies, establishing transportation networks, building their industrial base, and most relevant for us, improving communications between the telegraph and the post. When Swiss chair Eugene Morel pointed out in 1874 that the goal of the 21 founding fathers at the table sought to replicate what the ITU had already done for the ubiquity of the telegraph, there may have in fact been a larger calculus at play, a geopolitical calculus. My fifth observation therefore ponders whether the immutable laws of power politics are at play in considering concerns over freedom of transit in 2024, implementation of the SDGs, and whether there is a need for today's union of 192 diverse members to be mindful that the latitude the UPU enjoys is proportional to the discipline it has in not straying too far from its specialization in postal matters. In conclusion, the UPU has survived a number of existential crises over the past 150 years. During my involvement in UPU affairs, I have been a participant in some rather great debates concerning serious issues, such as the potential withdrawal of the United States from the Union, 
the upending of the terminal due system, and the COVID-19 global pandemic. To be certain, there have been other geopolitical issues which have drawn the UPU into quasi-diplomatic territory, some of which were even featured at the 2021 Abidjan Congress. Despite these challenges, however, the UPU has deep experience as a trailblazer in the area of global multilateral governance. It is, in my experience, a North Star for the conduct of global multilateralism and a shining example of how a commitment to supranationalism and a defined and delimited mandate can serve the lofty goal of globalization. My sixth observation is that the historical care that the UPU has paid to not passing too deeply into what Montgomery, what Montgomery Blair described as, quote, the usual dilatory course of diplomacy, and the UPU has stuck to its postal mandate and raison d'etre, has served it well and will in the future allow it to conduct its business across the single postal territory. To conclude, the UPU is at an inflection point on its journey in serving its members and humanity at large. This conference, which is dedicated to looking at its past, will no doubt inform the future to which it aspires. I hope that I've done justice to the paper I've tabled with the organizers, but perhaps more importantly to the attention you have afforded me. Thank you. And Chair, if I may, just two more quick comments. Um, as I listened to uh, the various papers that were presented today and reflected them on my, on my own paper, I asked myself the question, well, so what? What, what, are, what are these risks that I'm discussing in my paper? And um, what, why should historians care about them? And what can it tell us about the road um, in the future? On ICS2, uh, release two, uh, if member countries that will be discussing this issue are unable to come to an understanding on what overlapping or at least touching jurisdictions require, um, barriers may go up. Uh, various regions of the world may reciprocate what they see as limitations on the freedom of transit principle, and the single postal territory will erode on the basis of freedom of transit. With regards to governance, um, and the SDGs, there is a risk that common non-technical goals and aspirations can take the center stage and actually replace discipline consideration of technical and specialized postal issues. And the UPU ends up behaving in a way uh, that Montgomery Blair originally in 1862 had warned against, which is the usual dilatory course of diplomacy. Um, so again, if I could conclude on, on a single point, it would be that the future of the UPU will be um, bright but it does have to always remember the reason for which it was created. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. We have a very diverse panel. You have seen that we have uh, certain recurring themes, the globalization, uh, the universal values of the UPU, and we could also almost talk about deglobalization when we talk about secessionist movements with the tensions that can arise between states uh, with postal services. I think we have four or five minutes left, so we can take one or two questions. Yes? Thank you, Sébastien Richet, La Poste. I have a question for Mr. Baines. You mentioned the role of stamps, the materiality of these stamps in secessionist states. Was there a strategy to do with the network of post offices or postal staff? Where are you getting at with the question? Um, profile. Micro, please. Sorry, uh, am I audible? I'm, I'm not quite sure um, of the intent of the question. Um, can, could you rephrase that? Sorry. 
Ma, ma question portait sur my les question was regarding the uh, networks of post offices and postal employees you have spoken about the stamps the symbol of the stamps but what about the postal network and the staff any strategy by this this composition of post or not do you know that or oh, you have any no information about that no not that i i i i can't quite see the, the connection between the symbolism which was a, a, a kind of process of decolonization or symbolic decolonization itself and and, and what networks are being referred to Net, networks within countries or or between um countries between the network inside sorry no I, I, i'm going to have to pass and then i'm not quite sure that of the thrust of the question okay we will speak about that after thank you cecil y avait des réseaux de postes uh, dans les régions yeah, the question was were there networks of post offices in, in secessionist countries? Yes, I'm sure there were, and there was staff as well. But was there a secessionist strategy that used or called on the networks or the staff as there was with the stamps? Did the strategy include postal networks and staff? Did postal networks and postal staff were they part of a secessionist strategy, like the stamps that you showed? I think this is a discussion for after the meeting, because I think uh, you need to find uh, yourselves on the same page. Let's go on to the next question. Inherited a, uh, an administration that, uh, a postal system, an administration that already existed, um, and I can only assume that they bought into the, as officials of the secession of states, they bought into the, the vision of the leadership and the political elite of those states. Um, that's just an assumption I can make. I'm sure it didn't hold true for all, all um, officials. Um, and in as far as they um, continue to, to serve the state, um, they... I would imagine um, did um, feel convinced that what what they were doing is is correct in in um, disseminating these stamps and the symbolism um, that that was um, you know used as messengers of of state sovereignty on these stamps. That's probably about as as much as I can say about that. Thank you. We will take uh, another question. Yes, uh, a question for Mr. Uh, Rajiv Venegopal. That was a, a splendid paper. I look forward to reading it. I'm slightly surprised at the invocation of Montgomery Blair as a uh, expert non-political uh, inspiration for the UPU. Uh, he did not attend. John Casson attended, who wrote the Republican uh, platform in 1860. This is a political project in which the United States is trying to insert itself into international affairs during a, a civil war. Von Stepan tried to reshape the institution following the Franco-Prussian War. And then Rufi tried to beat back and successfully did the German proposal to honor Stepan and to affirm the French, which, which he did with the Marceau sculpture, which we have today. I admire the commitment of UPU administrators to a narrow technical mandate, but that mandate has a politics, and the organization has a politics, and it seems to me that it, in a historical Congress, we need to recognize that the organization has been and will remain embedded, as you know so well, 
in an international geopolitical order in which the movement of goods, people, and information uh, has a politics. So I, I guess I'm asking to respond to that, but I am surprised about the, uh, the reconceptualization of, of Montgomery Blair, uh, one of the wiliest politicians in Lincoln's cabinet. <clears throat> thank, thank you, sir. If, if, um, if I may uh, respond, uh, but let me reciprocate. I found your presentation um, outstanding and captivating. So, uh, and I was sitting roughly in the chair that you are in when the United States rose to make its notice of withdrawal from the UPU in 2018. So you're sitting in an auspicious spot in the room. With regards to the comments that were made by Montgomery Blair to the then US Secretary of State, my readings and preparation in the paper suggested to me that what Blair was looking for was for the conference, the Paris conference, to focus on the technical and operational, in other words, the specialized mandate that global postal exchange would require. Now, that's not to say he wasn't a wily um, political actor unto itself, unto himself. But what I gathered is that he was trying to differentiate, differentiate any mandate that would be accorded to what would become the General Postal Union, then later the Universal Postal Union. He tried to differentiate what would be the political mandate and what would be the operational mandate. So that's the, that's the distinction that I'm looking to draw, not to say that he wasn't a political character or had political influence, but it seems to me that as we look back in order to look forward, it is precisely in these areas of politics and diplomacy that the UPU finds itself in perhaps forced waters, but not waters in which it naturally swims. For example, when we dealt with the potential withdrawal of the United States from the UPU, or as the record will show, there has been treatment of various other issues such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, these are areas that typically we see the postal experts per se step back from, and we tend to have uh, the, in, uh, the involvement of diplomatic or member state actors that tend to take over in those discussions. And there's a whole host of other geopolitical diplomacy type issues that would fall to their, uh, to their address in their discussion. But as the, the further that the UPU with its international bureau and the representatives that sit in the POC and the CA that represent their countries, the further they stray from that postal mandate, I think the more dangerous waters they swim in. Does that address your comment, sir? Does that in any way uh, address uh, the point that oh. you're making? Thank you. I think- All right, go on. Uh, I go. think the- I'm afraid to say that the time is over. I would like to thank you, the panelists, for very for very interesting presentations. Uh, the the last presentation of the day, and uh, I give the floor to the organizers for the following uh, events. Thank you very much.